um, on and on and on until uh, deputy director uh, opportunity comes up uh, a few years ago. And so it has been a very lovely um, and enriching experience that I think so many students, volunteers, people can learn from. Um, we live in the nation's capital and there's a lot of expectations. Um, and in, like in this corner of the nation's capital looks markedly different than the folks that we're serving. And so I think these opportunities are so, um, they build so much character um, and a perspective of where you move on in your life. And, and like that's what happened for me. I was like, oh, I went from teaching, I'm a master's educator. And so it's just like went from teaching to, I think this is another place for me. And so I think this is a great opportunity for students as they're starting their lives. So I appreciate being here. Okay, so I guess I will present now. <laughs> Oh, he has. Yeah, I think I'm just looking at it from my perspective. Oh, yeah, you can just switch over the table. Okay. So the next slide. Um, yeah, well, I already introduced myself, but um, I've been at Horns Kids for about a year and a half now. So um, I've been able to work with AU in my whole time here, uh, specifically with Professor Chalka. So it's been awesome to get a lot of perspective on AU and on the students. Um, I think by now I have a pretty good handle of uh, how how to work with all of you and it's it's been great <laughs> so if you could just switch to the next slide thanks so a little bit more about Horton's kids um, our mission is to empower children living in some of the most under-resourced communities in southeast dc to ensure that children graduate on to high school and ready are, are ready for college career uh anything that they want to pursue after graduating from high school um, we work with 600 children and families in Southeast, uh, specifically two communities called Wellington Park and Sand Oaks. Um, we have three community resource centers. So what, two of them are in each of the two communities directly in the apartment complexes where those children and the families live so that they're able to get access to those resources right in their homes. Um, and then we recently opened up a third location called Horton's Hub. That's where our office is and um, where we invite partners to come to and we also hold programs there. It's really awesome that we have this third space so that we can uh, expand our programs um, and you know be able to host our own things at our own space. How many staff are on Horton's kids? Uh, I think right now we have about 23, 24. Um, so we are about mid small size. A lot of us are doing are completely kind of managing our own work and stuff, but you're because of we're such a small organization, you're able to be really personal with uh, the staff as well. So a bit more about what we do. Um, we have four main pillars that we serve the children and families on. Uh, health and wellness supports and community and family engagement are where we really touch on the parents. We want to make sure that parents are supported and have the resources that they need to succeed so that they can further support their kids. Um, and that helps with, you know, long run success for the children and for the families. Then we also have academic after school programs and youth development programs so uh, children can get academic supports and um, also work on, you know, social emotional learning and get enrichment, uh, go on fun field trips and all of that uh, kind of a fun aspect of it. But um, in turn, we also support, uh, support our families by distributing groceries. Uh, we're not, you know, a full-fledged grocery store or anything, <laughs> but due to um, the food desert in the area, we do try to provide a, a, a bit to keep people through the uh, through the week. So, um, I'll discuss a little bit more about how AU is involved with our organization, but I think Amanda had already discussed this um, when she presented. But uh, we've been working with Amanda Chalka for so long now, like a very long time. She used to be a volunteer and because she has been or, or involved in our organization for so long, she has a really deep understanding of what Portland's Kids is and that allows for a really strong partnership. Um, so now currently how our, our partnership kind of looks is we have uh, all of the students who are part of her um, complex problems class participate as homework helpers in our organization. Um, and then there's also a writing seminar that some students will participate as volunteers as well for our organization. So 
the student volunteers act as homework helpers. Um, that's kind of a free choice time for our children. Uh, right after they come back from school, they're coming home and they're, they got a lot of energy or they're extremely <laughs> tired. So they'll come here and uh, get their homework, do their homework, um, eat their meals, um, kind of let all their energy out before pr uh, proper tutoring starts. And then um, the student volunteers will kind of be around to support them, do some behavior management, make sure no student gets lost or anything like that. Um, and then when tutoring starts, they'll also support our enrichment program. We have so many elementary school kids running around our center all the time. So as many adult eyes, uh, we need more adult eyes to just like be on top of them. Uh, so our AU students are really helpful with that. And then some students will then continue on as tutors, kind of like leveling up as a volunteer after their first semester. If they are doing a good job and they really enjoy working with us. Um, and then- that's more of the academic tutoring. Yeah, so that's more of the academic tutoring. They'll be supporting our part-time teachers on actually helping out with the curriculum and teaching the kids on literacy. Uh, and then next school year, we'll also be uh, adding on a math curriculum as well. So if students aren't able to uh, participate in the times that we have for certain programs, they'll also participate in research uh, separately with a staff member. So, you know, there's always different projects that we'll be having that we don't have the capacity to work on ourselves because we have so much other stuff on our load. So we'll often have students who help do that research for us and uh, create projects. Um, so I talked more, I talked about homework help already, but other ways that students and volunteers can get involved are um, during research and admin projects. We have several episodic events uh, that we need one-time support for. Uh, so student volunteers are always welcome to help with that, whether it's like a big fundraising event or if we need support, um, you know, moving our storage from one place to another. The AU students are awesome doing that. One time we had, <laughs> a, so we had a soccer team come during, um, I think it was MLK day service, and they were able to move all of our things from one place up the stairs to another and then back. <laughs> um, and then another volunteer opportunity that we have for adults who are age 25 or older um, is a mentoring program. So if you have any like adult graduate students or you yourself want to mentor a child, um, you can have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a kid starting from eighth grade, and then you'll stick with them through high school graduation and help them uh, pursue their career aspirations or uh, college aspirations. So uh, a little overview of how students are prepared by the professor. Um, again, Amanda probably already went over this, but I think a big draw of uh, having Amanda as a professor is just having that personal experience volunteering at Horton's Kids. So she's able to answer any of those questions that are not on paper. Um, just having that experience is really helpful. And they have uh, lots of in-depth readings about uh, entering under-resourced under communities, uh, learning how to become anti-racist, uh, understanding white privilege and bias and other related issues that are very important to working in a population that is all black community, a low income community. Um, and then they also have a lot of class discussions where they're able to reflect on their time at programs and the privileges that they're experiencing or like any, any thought processes that they're going through, they're able to have that time to reflect on it in the classroom. Um, since, you know, while you're at programs, things move really fast. And if you're not having that time to reflect after, it's a little bit hard to fully learn and understand what you're really going through. Um, and then we also have a uh, very high communication where it's we're directly emailing all the time. We'll sometimes call each other just to like discuss something that comes up. Um, and it's that high communication is really valuable in ensuring that our, our partnership is, um, is going well. Oh, and then I'll also add, uh, Amanda's a good discipliner, so <laughs> yeah. so sometimes at Horton's Kids, like if a, a student is not participating in the way that we expect them to as a volunteer and our uh, general guidelines of how we work with that volunteer is like not really working out, uh, Amanda's able to talk with the student in a different way that perhaps would reach them better as a student rather than a, an, a volunteer. Right, and then the next slide, okay. Um, so how Horton's Kids prepares our students, uh, we go through an overall training for all of our volunteers 
the students will come to that volunteer training as well. Um, and we'll go over how what Horton's Kids is, uh, the communities we serve, we'll talk about generally like what the uh, racist history of DC looks like and how that's affecting Horton's Kids um, and how, what that looks like at our organization. Um, we talk about unconscious bias, we do some DEI training, uh, and then we also have some uh, social emotional learning, uh, behavior management, um, trauma-informed care trainings. We have a lot of different topics that we'll go through with our volunteers. Uh, it's hard to kind of do that all right in the beginning of the school year, so we'll try to spread it out a little bit. Um, I'm hoping that this upcoming school year we'll be able to thread in official trainings throughout, you know, like every few months or so, so that people are getting trained um, throughout the school year so that, you know, once you, if you learn something once at the beginning of the school year, you kind of start forgetting it as yeah. time goes on. <laughs> so it's helpful to kind of have those refreshers. Um, and then we'll also be really clear about what volunteer expectations are, um, how often they're expected to come, if they can't come, like what do they do and um, general program logistics. We also have a weekly newsletter where that's how volunteers get all of their information every single week. For example, if programs are closed or if we have any other updates, they'll see it on there. Um, and then we do a lot of individual communications. Um, I oftentimes go to programs myself and just talk to the volunteers in person. So I, that's something that I really enjoy, you know, getting that uh, personal touch with the volunteers and ensuring that they know who I am and they know who other staff members are for any, for any questions that they have. And kind of like um, if students, student volunteers are a bit nervous about volunteering, um, I'll be there and doing the volunteering with them. And uh, hopefully that can kind of I'll help out with any nerves. Okay. Can we do the next slide? Yes. Thanks. So what works well with the AU partnership? Um, I think partnering with a DC nonprofit and volunteering as a student is so beneficial because it's introducing all of these new DC residents to what DC is. Um, when I was a student, I started volunteering directly. I volunteered with Higher Achievement, if you guys volunteer mm -hmm. with them, yeah. Um, and I think that was a great way for me to like practice taking the Metro and <laughs> practice like yeah. seeing a new space outside of my campus bubble. Um, and that's so important to living in a city that is so like segregated. Um, it's important for the students to be exposed to different communities. Um, I think also, the student's cultural competency is a lot higher than other volunteers that I'm interacting with. Um, we have adult volunteers from all over the place who, you know, are just living their lives, but they're not always actively thinking about uh, their their race and their identity in in as a uh, part of our community. And so, having the students be actively learning about these these topics and um, thinking about it in relation to themselves in place of uh, at Horton's Kids, it's just really helpful for them to already have that knowledge. It's, you know, really hard to teach people about cultural competency, and yeah. it takes a long time. So uh, having them already have that knowledge, is just, it's really greatly beneficial. Um, also, on a logistical standpoint, volunteers are guaranteed for us every semester. <laughs> um, as a nonprofit, I'm sure you would probably know, like, recruiting volunteers is tough. Um, so having this like huge handful of volunteers to automatically come and uh, have that motivation to come every single week because they have a class requirement is really helpful to us. It's a little bit less work on our end. Um, and then I already talked about Russell Chalka being a very assertive and being a good yeah. asset to us. <laughs> um, and I think having that specific like high communicative relationship is helpful to uh, have a good a good experience on both ends of partnership. Um, we yeah. model a lot of they're not always going to make the right choice or the best choice, but they're making progress mm -hmm. and they're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's yep. okay. Yeah. Okay, on the next slide. So we do, well, we do love this AU partnership. There are always some challenges. Um, the main point, I think, definitely being the high turnover. We get a lot of guaranteed volunteers, but then oftentimes they'll leave after a semester um, when their class ends. Mm -hmm. So uh, encouraging students to continue working with a nonprofit or continue volunteering is super helpful. Um, it's the same thing as staff turnover, like it's easier mm -hmm. to keep the same volunteer 
them to train a new one every few months. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we have several background checks that students have to go through uh, because they are working with minors. So those background checks last actually for two years. And a lot of the times they can apply to other uh, nonprofits, but it kind of depends. Um, a lot of nonprofits have slightly different variations of background checks that they go through. So it's really helpful if volunteers would stay at least a year, um, but we understand that doesn't always work out for their schedules. We had two people do the whole year. Yeah. And we also have one or two people working at summer camp this summer. I think just one. Okay. Yeah. Even just having one person return is like amazing <laughs> <laughs> because the kids love them. <laughs> and, um, but you know, a lot of the students are very enthusiastic to work with Horton's kids, but then some students do sign up for the class and not fully understand what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. And then they kind of get stuck in the class for the whole semester and they're like, I don't actually like volunteering with Horton's kids. I'd rather find another place to volunteer with, or like maybe it doesn't align with my passions or something like that. So um, some students aren't always as enthusiastic to volunteer with us. Um, so I think, you know, when students are signing up for classes, being really upfront about what they're going to be doing that whole semester is super important. Um, we also definitely want to increase the diversity of our volunteers. Um, AU is a PWI, so it's not, you know, we have a lot of white women volunteers who are with our organization and that's kind of a trend uh, around us as just a volunteer base. So we definitely want to increase that diversity. I think AU actually has been very positive in like bringing a lot of queer volunteers to our organization um, and exposing our kids to the LGBTQ community. So mm -hmm. that's been a plus. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I would note um, that we are, Horton's Kids wants to get better at, at being more open to that and teaching our children, uh, you know, having a, to have a positive mindset and have a positive perspective on our on queer students. We did have one student from Horton's Kids come out to one of my students last mm -hmm. spring. Good for them. Um, just kind of wild yeah, yeah wild. we have never we don't I feel like at Horton's kids and just generally in the community it's uh, really heteronormative it's still and so still taboo. yeah it's still pretty taboo so like having queer students be at Horton's kids and be open yeah. is awesome for our kids and PD, PWI is predominantly white, white yeah mm -hmm. predominantly white institution um and then the last few things is just AU's on the exact opposite side of DC, <laughs> Anacostia. So um, doing that commute is pretty tough for our students. Um, and we definitely appreciate that commute that people are taking every single week, but we know it can be a tough challenge for them. Uh, so we do the best that we can on, you know, the AU has lift um, stipends for students to take if they, um, they need to get to, to their volunteering earlier or quicker. Uh, we also provide a shuttle for students to take them from our center to the metro because our center is a bit far from the metro as well. Um, we also um, talked in class about how they could do things like load readings or at least listen to readings, yeah. different ways to get their work done in metro, which a number of students have actually said because they have that hour each way, they're actually spending more time doing their work. Yeah. I mean, you have to sit there anyway. Yeah. And listen to your podcast for fun. And yeah. the, one of the ways we've tried to build in this incentive to also leave this kind of Ward 3 area, go. Uh, further away, which isn't always an uh, appealing thing to a student, is for every hour they spend um, traveling back and forth, they can count 30 minutes towards their uh, hours requirement. Oh, uh, nice. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely helpful. Yeah. I, I see the students logging those hours for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, the last thing I'll add is there's a lot of anxiety before volunteering. You know, you're new to DC, you're new to this area. Um, and it can be very nervous. And a lot of times students that are working with our kids, that's the first time they're ever working with children and youth. Um, so trying to work through that pre-service anxiety is a bit challenging. Um, we've been slowly trying to figure out how to improve that. Um, there's a lot of conversations between Amanda and I on like, what can we do to train them better or like um, get to know them better so that students don't feel as nervous. Um, 
yeah, and like, I don't know if you've already spoken about that. I mentioned the pre-service anxiety, the way fragility, the mm -hmm. fear of positive harm, which then causes mm -hmm. them to act more shy right. instead mm -hmm. of getting to know the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and especially because students tend, you know, they'll stay for six months or so, um, and it takes several months to get used to working with kids and like feel comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we want students to like just launch right in and uh, be ready to discipline the kids or like talk mm -hmm. to them, get to know them. Um, so being open to that experience is really important uh, and being able to just step right in. Um, Our students very much, they realize legally most of them are adults, mm -hmm. but I finally started referring to them in the classroom as young adults. Mm -hmm. Like there's now some research saying, talking to one of our psychology degrees, uh, <laughs> the ages between 18 and 25 is another yeah. stage of young adult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So there are some things that are most certainly at tutoring going to be beyond their pay grade, but you are still an authority figure to the children. And a number of students, especially in the last two-ish years, have become more uncomfortable with that aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, And it might be due to like the pandemic of, you know, your growth kind of getting stunted for a few <laughs> years. years. I definitely yeah. feel that. Um, yeah. I'm 24 and I still don't feel like I should be here presenting to you all sometimes. <laughs> um, so I understand that like nervousness of like, am I even, do I even have the authority to do this thing to the, or to talk to the kids and tell them to, you know, to go upstairs or like right. <laughs> sit down. Um, and a lot of the students, I've heard some students talk to the kids or like be nervous of disciplining the kids because they're like, well, I feel like they're my friend and we're the same mm. age but they're working with fifth graders. Yeah. You have a big age difference and there's a lot of development changes that could happen in between those two times. So and what is the age, age range of the students you serve? Yeah, so we serve kindergarten through 12th grade, uh, but our the AU students specifically work with the elementary schoolers because we know that uh, we don't want them working with high schoolers. They're basically the same age at that point. You know, mm -hmm. um, They're fresh out of high school, These a lot of these uh, college yeah. students. So we don't necessarily want them working with high schoolers, uh, but we do have, you know, second and third year students who are who are tutoring with middle and high school, um, and that works out well. You know, they have a little bit more maturity under their belt after a year of college, and they've gone through that like first year college nerves. Uh, so they have that the authority mm -hmm. and responsibility to be able to work with middle and high school, but they still have the youth in them to like relate to the middle and high schoolers. So we actually find that, uh, you know, getting that like middle class um, group of students. Is really helpful working with the older students, the older participants for us. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. And then so um, uh, we have a really big goal for Ernst Kids is to um, increase our diversity and um, uh, just specifically diversity of volunteers because those are most of the people who are interacting with our children. So it's definitely important that. We recruit more diverse volunteers, whether of all aspects, so whether it's race or sexuality or even career aspirations or any of that, because it's showing the kids um, that they could achieve anything that they want if they're, uh, or just expose them to different careers and all that. Um, we also want to bring in more DEI resources to our volunteers so that they can be learning throughout uh, their volunteer experience. Um, I know that the students get that through their CBL course, and that's I think that's a wonderful um, part of volunteering, of being able to learn and then do. Uh, so we wanna bring that to our other volunteers as well. Uh, and then also, I think the last thing of, uh, is just trying to find the right volunteers who are committed to social justice in the same way that our organization and our staff are. So uh, finding those CBL students who choose to be in the class and choose to be doing this work is, um, I think that definitely aligns with our mission. Um, to, you know, mission of, of working towards social justice. Uh, so lastly, we have, you know, just a few suggestions. If you are considering doing a CBL course, uh, make sure that you're enrolling students who have that passion for social justice and are actually inter internally motivated as a volunteer. It's one thing that they're required to do it for their class credit, but it's another if they're like, okay, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go out to Southeast and I'm gonna have a good time. Uh, having that mindset is definitely critical to actually having the student enjoy their class and enjoy volunteering. Um, I definitely would suggest uh, sharing any educational resources that you're bringing to the students with uh, to bring it to the nonprofit. Uh, 
again, I said this earlier, but nonprofits often don't have the time to do our own reading and do our own research. So if you already have that on hand, um, it can be helpful for us just, you know, to do, to share that learning. Um, definitely emphasize the, that volunteering for a long time is better than volunteering just for a short time. Um, students often love to do something, do a little project for a semester, but uh, you have to consider that like, if you're going to do some project, you have to ensure that it's going to last after the student leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, so creating, if you're doing a project, for example, um, or you're creating, maybe you're, say you're creating like some sort of communication plan for your class or the student is doing that. Uh, the student should also create external documents for later on like how to actually execute this communication plan. And uh, I would encourage students to check in with the nonprofit later um, on how they're doing with that or if they need support, like holding the nonprofit accountable for um, continuing that project. Um, and that also goes to just generally, if you're a direct service volunteer, uh, if you're volunteering for a whole year and you're working with the same clients or the same, the same children, or if it's adults working with the same adults, building that long-term relationship is super helpful. Um, and then defining expectations as a student versus who you are as a volunteer is also important. Um, in, I think it was like a year ago, Amanda and I were not, weren't very specific about um, who to talk to, which, who the student should talk to about their class uh, requirements versus their volunteer requirements. Um, we thought it was pretty implied, but it wasn't. So mm -hmm. sometimes you need to lay that all on paper. Um, and just generally like be clear about what the student is expected to do at volunteering, what they're expected to do in class, uh, what is a student, what they'll be doing throughout the whole course. How they should dress. Mm. Oh yes, and how they should dress, yeah. <laughs> we refer to the crop top role, for instance. Mm -hmm. so I think we're all familiar that crop tops are back in fashion, but they're possibly not appropriate wear for mm -hmm. volunteering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As much as it kills me to please people's clothing. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah, we don't like to do that either, but um, I'm sure it's different for other organizations, but with ours, since we're working with children, it's definitely important to be dressing appropriately for the kids. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that is all I have. But if, I don't know if you guys yeah, want to have them answer questions for me first or have to share. I guess, does anybody have a question uh, to Kiana directly? And if so, then um, just unmute and, and say it into the chat or if anybody here has one. Otherwise, we'll move into Tashira's and then have questions at the end involving everybody. So I just want to give a second. Yeah. yeah. What is your non-student volunteer base? Mm. Like, like uh what do like, 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 ages like other like just not your not like the students not but the, the, from the community students. yeah um i would say we do have i think it's majority white women um but we have over the past year or so since i've been here been able to increase the diversity a bit more um we'll have a lot of like young people who are new to the city too um we have some, uh, we've been increasing our black volunteer base um, slowly but steadily. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a diverse group of, you know, different career backgrounds. Uh, we have uh, some, you know, our, our, well, our Portland Skits history was kind of rooted in working on Capitol Hill. So our, you know, our mm -hmm. founder worked on Capitol Hill. So a lot of her connections uh, and now the organization's connections are like largely political. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of people who work like in the Department of Education or Transportation or like nice. in the you know congressional offices and stuff like that. Um, but we definitely want to diversify that as well. Are yeah. volunteer hours mostly like after school hours for students? Yeah, so they're all after school hours since you know the students are in school and then they'll come right home. Uh, we try to have a balance of like doing it late enough where people who are working that nine to five can get to programs but also early enough so that students aren't you know, exhausted when they're <laughs> participating in tutoring. So it's, it's definitely a tough balance and we've been kind of like adjusting it uh, every, every semester to see what works. In the earlier days, Warden's kids actually used to tutor in the Rayburn House Building, the Department of Education, because of the former founder and executive director's ties to Capitol Hill, she's a staffer. Mm -hmm. um, that was 
incredibly challenging in some ways scheduling wise because you'd have to bus out to Anacostia, collect the children, bus the children back to Rayburn, oh, wow. tutor, put the children back on the bus, take them back to Anacostia. Plus it's also instilling this idea that something's wrong with Anacostia. So mm. the new model is volunteers go to Anacostia to the children. It's closer to their home. They can get to bed on time. It's right. much easier for the children in the community, which should be the priority. Way to go. Um, That's great. Yeah. yeah. Plus, there's a lot less drama with the Rayburn um, security. <laughs> yes, yeah. That's what I was just imagine so bringing like 50 kids through security. Yeah. And that's <laughs> oh, like, <laughs> telling them they can't play with the uh, microphones that are right there. Which is really <laughs> a lot. Yeah. If you have children, I'm sure you understand the challenge. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my sister's place, and, and what I um, will say is, is that the projects that have been worked on this semester are not limited to the scope of how um, folks can volunteer. So just say that, because we'll highlight what was done, but then there's also a plethora of things that can be done. Um, so my sister's place is an organization that's a little over 40 something years old, like 45. I think we're having our 45, 35th year anniversary next year. And we have served um, survivors of domestic violence um, in multiple capacities. It started off as a hotline. And um, I think the Women's Defense League, I think was who started that, that bad boy. And what we found out uh, 40 uh, something years ago was that people needed a place to go. And so then we opened up a shelter that shelter, we found out that clients don't want to just leave, they want to leave with their children. So we expanded our shelter. What we found out is, is that shelter isn't the best place for people to heal in their journey. It's a great landing spot. So then we moved into transitional housing. What we found out as we moved into transitional housing is it's almost impossible to transition if you are coming with just the clothes on your back and barely any access to your money if you had any to begin with. And in doing that, we started to expand and expand and we keep kind of moving to serve the families in different ways. So we now provide, um, whether it's gently used, so um, gently used furniture for new apartments, you know, your kind of starter kit for all college students, you completely get moving year to year. So you know um, what that can be and what a financial burden that could be. Um, but then also providing what we call fresh start funds for the for the survivors and the clients that we serve. And that fresh start fund is because a small thing that may not be a big deal to us can completely destabilize um, a, a family. So your phone bill being cut off because you couldn't pay is a real issue because then now we can't get in contact with you. So we pay those things or your credit is shot because of something that unfortunately the abuser or batter or perpetrator, whatever word is your preference, um, runs up your credit and now you can't get into housing. So we try to do things that give uh, folks the opportunity to have that fresh start that is not this burden that will easily destabilize them after they've worked for a year, two, three, four, five years to stabilize. Um, and then we've just moved into the um, universal ba basic income space. We're calling it emergency cash transfer. So um, uh, in our transitional housing program, um, just this year, we started doing $500 for two years to families, um, no strings attached. The only thing that we're really asking if they want to participate is this checking in with us every quarter to half a year. So that way we just know that you're doing okay. And in hopes, obviously from the side of the UBI supporter or the universal basic income, we're, I'm calling it that, but we call it emergency cash transfer. So I should probably call it the right name. We're calling it Rise Trust. And it's the idea that, you know, what people actually need is money. And I don't need to tell you what you need to do with the money. We've heard people say, um, uh, go off on a quick tangent. People say, well, how do you know they're not buying beer or drugs? And I was just like, well, you know what? I have three children and a lovely husband that, and a pretty high demand job. And every once in a while, I need a glass of wine and I wouldn't <laughs> dare you to tell me I can't have it. And so I think about that, um, that no, we're not perpetuating um, this idea of drug use or, or alcoholism, but we are saying do what you need to do to take care of yourself and your family and only you know what's best. But also we are paired with case management and that's a huge part of our work. Um, so that said, kind of like just an overview of just a kind of a fraction of what we're doing. Obviously we do things like this, like doing some education piece and getting some folks hopefully 
wanting to be a part of this cause of racial equity. And um, this is a huge part of it. And I think MSP has not necessarily named ourselves as being a part of that space, but we definitely are. We've been addressing it in secret, but if you, as you saw in the numbers that came out through the pandemic, um, it was the, it was the like pandemic within the pandemic, the epidemic within the pandemic. And that was a very true thing. Um, so if we wanna, I don't know, if it's a click, yeah. <laughs> um, what, I just wanna talk about the kind of the, the collaboration that did happen and it, this is kind of one section. It was more on the administrative side of things, which would provide some, certainly maybe an area of interest, some more topics, all the things that you were saying, Kiana really hit home for me because um, we would be exposing people to things that can be very triggering and can be very, I like to use the word activating as opposed to triggering, but but we also can provide something that may be more of interest and more related to what you are interested in, what your skill sets are, or what you would like to explore. So for instance, with the Spanish translation, one of the things that we very intentionally did about five or six years ago was move into the space around helping immigrant survivors specifically because their barriers are even larger than the folks that we are working with um, predominantly, I think 99%, 98%, give or take the year, um, um, black and brown survivors of domestic violence, typically single moms um, and low income making below 9,000, 12,000 a year. So that's nothing to live on. That said, um, reaching into the community in Northwest, um, we found that one of the issues was accessibility. And we talk about accessibility. This is, what did you say, how many nonprofits? Over 14,000. Okay, so it's not that the things aren't here, it's the accessibility that's the issue. And you may say, well, I mean, what do you mean? It's, if you don't know how to read the language, or if you don't know the language, you don't even know what they're offering. If you come from a country that typically anything associated or affiliated with or funded by the government is dangerous to you, you are not going to pursue that. So one of the things that's just been so important for us is to make sure that the information we're providing and putting forth is, is in a language that can be understood by the person receiving it. And so that's the other thing. One of the examples I like to give, and I think it was, um, Miss Brenda's class um, brought this up in their in their um, uh, I guess whatever you call it, their final presentation their final product was that there are words that just don't translate well so empowerment we love that word in the in the, <laughs> in, the, in, the in the in the service field but it does not translate well into Spanish it does it doesn't even have a Spanish word as, as a matter of fact so how do you translate or interpret a word, because that's what it is. It's more of an interpretation than a translation. How do you get that word across? Because that is the really the nuts and bolts of what we're trying to do. We don't want to tell you what to do. We want to present options to you and inform you and let you know kind of what might be safe for you and then empower you encourage. I don't know. I don't actually want to encourage you. I just want you to look at the options and for you to make decisions for yourself. How do you translate that? But that is so important for us to do and be able to, com to convey in our public facing documentation. So um, that was some of the work that was done with the with um, Brenda Works class where they looked at some of our forward facing um, I think including our volunteer page to help get those items translated into Spanish. And it was super difficult. It's super difficult because when I typically talk, I'm using just like when you said PW, like we have all these, like, it's almost like we're the military, we've got all these acronyms and like none of them really make sense to the general public. And that's something that we did have to decide, which probably came out of some of the discussion is that is this website for volunteers or funders or people that want to contribute to the cause? Or is it for someone to seek out and get help? And those are decisions that have to be made. But that discussion with the students was really fruitful for us. Um, the Excuse vision, me, yes. this film right here, did a student make that for you? Or did yes. They, oh, which class was that? Was it? it was visual literacy with Chung Wei. Is that it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that's going to be played here next. And they also, I was going to add it, but I didn't want to overkill. They also <laughs> did some um, infographics that were really, really, really wow. helpful. Um, these are things that I'm so, you, honestly, I hate coming after her because she really did a great job of saying nonprofits are on like shoestring budgets. We're doing the most we can with the least. And so like infographics sound really fun. And I would love to sit on Canva all day, 
but I got work to do. And, <laughs> but that work is so important, right? So it's finding that balance and you all, this is such an important program because it, it expands our capacity to do fruitful work. That said, um, something like this, I would love to sit and do this. I just don't have the capacity yeah. to do it. But someone who is fresh and can like throw some ideas and allow some veto power here and there, willing to take the feedback and work with us, excellent. And so um, the impact data, the idea is to, is to put that on our Twitter and whatever else, what are all the things, come on, you're 20 something, Instagram. Instagram and all those things, right? To put those things forward to, again, draw that attention that is needed for this cause. Again, if to improve, you know, I always say this, there are two people when it, when it comes to causes, those that make the noise and bring the attention and those that are sitting back there doing the work. I tend to be the one on the back end, but we need somebody to draw attention. This mm -hmm. video is so great. Um, the idea was to use it as part of one of our um, fundraising campaigns that's coming up. Um, yeah. watch it. I might yeah. need to play that only because you're- Of the, of the sound? Yeah. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Okay. That up. And I would love to make actually a few observations too and give a little bit of background because this was kind of like one of the classic examples of how creating community partnerships end up uh, when you're trying to make something like a long lasting partnership. As Kiana said with Amanda, they've been working together for some time. It's really easy to keep partnership when those two individuals know each other. Um, within my sister's place, I guess, what's the staff size and what has been some of the recent, I guess, changes within the staff? Oh yeah, uh, that's a great question. So we are a medium-sized nonprofit. We just expanded about two years ago. So we're about full-time folks, close to 40. And um, we had barely really any, and I would say turnover in a negative way, but we really had a lot of people that were there. Like I said, I've been there for 10 years. Um, and then just recently had like a big bunch of turnover. Um, and it's, it's not indicative of anything bad. It's just I guess, I don't know, the way the wind has shifted, I don't know. Um, and so, and, and, and in nonprofits in general. And the one thing I can say is that we have for a long time had a younger staff. Is it not? Oh, oh yeah. Um, we've had a younger staff and I consider myself a younger person. Um, don't ask me how old I am. <laughs> that said, you know, um, one of the things that MSP prides themselves on is exactly, I told you my trajectory on purpose. I came in with this, they see, you know, the heart in you, and they're looking to recruit you to do more and be more for the organization. And that's exactly what has happened. So we've had a lot of folks develop. I actually just have the folks that you guys might be working with now were at MSP five years ago and are back. I mean, we, when you get a part of that mission and that cause, you you kind of fall in love with it and it's hard to 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 separate yourself from it. Not to, not that you should. I actually I'm trying to think of like, can I be on? I don't know. <laughs> Given the, the issue you're addressing, I imagine there's also a lot of security issues. Security yeah, I'm gonna get to that. And things like yeah, that. I'm gonna get to that right okay. after we play this video. Um, and then I'll kind of talk to you about why. Can you guys hear it? And just a few other observations as we're getting the video. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I feel like we can see it just how uh, successful and well developed our nonprofit professionals and representatives are. And I think part of that is Perhaps you're straight. taking on a lot of responsibility. It doesn't matter exactly what you enter in to a nonprofit culture skills wise, you're going to develop everything <laughs> under the sun, most likely within the first few years. And so when I think when students see that and they have almost a mentor within that process itself, where it's oftentimes people who are a bit younger, mm -hmm. working at nonprofits who are now amazing speakers, amazing people behind the scenes, able to work with so many uh, different stakeholders. Like, I think that that's something that I know personally I saw, I wanted to go into that field after working with nonprofits because I, I saw how kind of corporate mentorship looked mm -hmm. and then I saw how nonprofit mentorship looked. And there was such a big, uh, jump there. And one of the other things I just wanted to mention with uh, my sister's place specifically, you heard Toshira talk about Brenda's class. So that Spanish translation course was that direct service type of course. So 20 hours per student uh, working with a representative. We all want to live in safe, place secure. Who, who spoke Spanish and who could then 
say, oh, we have this program called RISE, but the acronym RISE doesn't translate into Spanish that same way. Yeah. So what are we going to do about that? And like hearing that back and forth collaboration on that direct service front versus now this video that you're about to see, this is something from a project-based course. And so that one where you have to set deliverables in advance, get feedback on it. And then there's still that nervousness from the students too, where it's like, we've put in all this time. We hope that the video actually captures what it is that the intention was. And if you have feedback, like try and let us know before we're off for the summer. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. We also right. want a break too. So um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, hopefully yeah. we have a video. Perfect. Okay. We all want to live in safe, secure homes yeah. where our families... And this, this video, uh, first off, it is available on YouTube. Originally, the partnership that was created was through um, so the spouse of somebody who worked at AU connected us with my sister's place. Uh, with families can grow and thrive. And so... Domestic violence brings... Oh, there it is. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so we had people working in the development space, then people working mm -hmm. in on the marketing space. And so it's really interesting that it was across the organization and not just like centered around one program. Uh, and this was made by underclassmen. I just want to say, yeah, like, this, is, this was super cool to me. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> we all want to live in safe, secure homes where our families can grow and thrive. Domestic violence brings turmoil into homes, trapping families in dangerous situations. With My Sister's Place, survivors can return to normal lives. Our mission is to shelter, support, and empower survivors of domestic violence and their children, while providing leadership and education to build a supportive community. In 2022 alone, my Sister's Place served a total of 146 survivors and 201 children throughout all programs. 89 survivors were provided with safe, secure emergency shelter. 4,738 case management and counseling sessions were provided to adults and children. 131 survivors transitioned from shelters or other crisis locations to transitional housing. Join My Sister's Place in building a safe, supportive community for all families in the Washington metro area. A gift from you will keep our critically needed programs available, providing shelter, food, and emergency services to survivors of domestic violence and their children. We are truly grateful for your support. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we were working with um, Hadaway um, Communications, and, and they really helped us because we're trying to move, and again, this is really cool because I think a person who's really invested, and we can go on to the next slide whenever you have, the, have it available to do so, is we wanna help change that narrative. We wanna help exactly like you said, let's go to Anacostia, there's nothing wrong with it. If you treat it like there's something wrong with it, there will always be something wrong with it. Um, and the same thing, it's just like kind of how we're looking at um, the the the, clients that we're serving, the people that we're serving. That said, one of the things, and this brings up what you were just uh, starting to get to, is that making sure that students understand the sensitivity of both for them and for the folks that we're serving. This is where you talk about showing up. It's so important to show up because let's say we decide to do a program. We used to actually collaborate with um, uh, University of Maryland where the psychology students would um, come for a semester and then each semester I think that was happening to do a, a children's playtime project if you will um, very some, something very similar twice a week and so that was one of the volunteer projects it was very rooted in the work that they would be doing and things like that um, we've had people paint our shelter we couldn't afford the hundred thousand that was going to do to paint the shelter that's one of those first pictures that you saw they, they painted the, like this really beautiful mural so they're um, the interior there's so many projects that that we could do that are exactly what you're saying episodic or it could be a project that is so important um so there's the what you could do is probably endless just like this marketing campaign the big thing though is the confidentiality piece 
it's one of those things where folks kind of lose sight of that. And they're like, well, what, you know, I, um, uh, you know, this is the, this is the shelter that, that I volunteer at. It's like, oof. And they don't quite understand why it is important while you're sitting on the bus not to point out the domestic violence shelter because it's not something that they can relate to. But there's the other side of it. Domestic violence is not isolated to those in Southeast DC. It actually affects just about everybody in some fashion, some way, and it can be very activating. And what we have found for those who work with the children especially is that there is, there is a lot of guilt and or activation where they maybe remember a time for themselves. And it's really important to have those discussions about what this work is rooted in, what you may see. So I'll give an example. I used to do some of the training for the volunteers to say, listen, there's a mom who may not have a great relationship with their child. That child forms a great relationship with you, mom's jealous, and now we have another issue. Or child is forming an unhealthy attachment to you. It's things that you can't predict, right? That you think that you're doing the right thing, or you get to go home and a kid just bawls and starts crying. And now you don't know how, you can't sleep for the week because you left the kid bawling and crying at a very beautiful shelter, by the way, and I'm not being just biased, but it's one of those things where we just wanna make sure that persons coming into that space have a deep understanding and it can be found on the website. It can be, again, through the work that you're doing, but not just coming because it's a requirement because this can be very harmful work. And I, and I say that out loud as a person who's been doing it for about 15 years. It can be very harmful to you. Um, and so that's a, a really big deal. So on the My Sister's Place side, we wanna make sure that we have very clear, defined deliverables, clear objectives about what we're looking to achieve. So for instance, from uh, these projects here, they were deliverables, they were very much deliverables. But from the other places that we've collaborated with, we can't have you saying that you're gonna come and tell a kid that you're gonna come and then never show up again. That is so harmful to children who are already so vulnerable as well as the mom who wants to like eat in peace while you play with her kid. So it's just those things that we wanna make sure that they understand that you are working with the human condition and you're working with those um, really deeply. Um, yeah, you can, you, some of the other things I don't wanna repeat because these are all the same things. Timely correspondence, making sure to hold us accountable to the work, communicating challenges as they're happening, don't be so afraid. Um, and um, you can move on to the next to the next slide. Oh, oh, he's Sorry. doing it. Oh no, you're okay. Yeah. You're okay. You're okay. Sorry, I didn't realize who was doing it. So, time and capacity. I am. I always call call myself a professional student because I would love to be a college student for the rest of my life. Somebody's like, well, didn't do your PhD. I was like, I don't want to be held accountable for it. <laughs> so that said, I know capacity and time is an issue, but it's also an issue for us, right? So. It's good to know on the front end, like how many documents do we need to do or write-ups that we need to do or whatever it is on both sides. So that way we are again, holding each other accountable and understanding what the needs are. So that way we don't fall short. Cause I know that these students do need this attention and they need that stuff, but we don't want to like drop somebody off. And then they're like, so I haven't heard from the person that I'm supposed to be talking with. So I want to make sure that that relationship from the very beginning is set. And I always say like regularly scheduled on your calendar. And this is training for the real world as well for students, right? Like this is what work looks like. Um, and so the other piece that I would say is smaller projects, start small. In the beginning, when you have the zeal, it's easy to be like, yeah, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And we're gonna blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, oh, and then I have midterms. And oh, guess what? I'm really busy. I have a bunch of talking uh, events. So how are we gonna make it? And that's what ends up happening. And so I think you start small and build the capacity. If, if that's what I would suggest. Um, the other part is, again, like the agreed upon scheduled check-ins with whoever needs to be involved in those check-in pieces. And then um, I don't know how you would navigate this because I know semesters are kind of short, especially as things get going, but I'm sure you alluded to this and I really do find that this can happen, especially specifically in our work, is you find that you're no longer interested for whatever reason. It could be it's too activating. It could be that it's just, it's too close to an issue that you don't want to be a part of, um, or you just got too busy. But I just wonder if built in that there's an opportunity for client or I'm gonna say clients, for students to um, do something alternative. 
again, so we can plan ahead because there is someone depending on you. Like, you know, that campaign, that's probably going to be played at um, one of our fundraisers. And that fundraiser is to help us acquire another building. And that other building is something that we need because the budget just came out and we don't have, you know what I mean? So these things really have rolling effects and we don't want to put that much pressure on an undergraduate student who otherwise was just trying to do the best that they can. Um, so yeah, so the opportunities, um, and we don't have to belabor this, but they're, they're kind of endless, right? From outreach to, huh? Oh. oh, I don't know. It's not presenting. Oh, oh, well, I can, I can still not, name them. It's uh, like, you know, children. I'm not a child. That's what this is. I'm doing this. Do we want to go to the next oh, yeah. slide? Yeah, the next slide. Yes, thank you. That's okay. Well, it's okay. Um, that um, the volunteer opportunities are like playing with the children. That's for the evening folks. And we usually, mom would love to eat at six o'clock and eat without having to feed her two children, you know, or take a shower in peace, <laughs> you know, you know, the, the shelter setting is one that's just not as easy as you think. Um, but then it could also be homework help, um, reading to the children. That's something that I'm sure, you know, literacy is quite an issue in the community and it's, um, quite a big deal, but those are like in-person things that does require a bit more clearance. It takes a little bit more time, which is another kind of barrier, but there's also kind of some of these other pieces like cleaning out our basement, getting things organized. We move families from our shelter or from the community to other places, like loading up. I think I think it's Alpha Chi. There's a couple other like sororities that we can call on and they're like, yeah, we'll, sh we'll meet you at the storage. They'll load up a U-Haul, get a family moved in, like decorate it really pretty and then move on. Um, so that's great. Beautification projects during the spring. Flowers make people feel better. A freshly painted room make people feel better. Then there's also things like maybe not volunteering your time, but in kind. So maybe you do a diaper drive or a tampon drive or um, in winter, we always need hats, scarves, gloves. And you know what I mean? Like uh, I had a, somebody did a knit-a-thon. So <laughs> cool, right? So that's what I was saying. The options are endless. The service project, you can be super creative. Just be lenient with us around um, how much supervision we can provide as well, because we are a little bit limited. Um, but then there's also some people who are like, I would really like to do a research project. Like for instance, that program that I was just telling you about, we're throwing everything at you. <laughs> Cash transfer, paying to get your debt removed, um, maybe you know contributing to home ownership, all of these things thrown at, we would love to have someone do some research on that and and follow it for a year to see like what the the um, what the results are. We don't have the capacity to do that. So again, um, this is such a great opportunity for students. It's a wonderful opportunity for the provider as well. And I'm really glad that you guys are so dedicated to doing this. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As we get into questions, one thing I, I just want to say is uh, we have heard now from the faculty, we've heard from students and from our nonprofit representatives. There's clearly a lot of, again, momentum, power within the space. And I think what at the end of the day is needed is some of the uh, structure, the support to really leverage this. Because when we have opportunities, sometimes they're one-time opportunities, sometimes they need a full long, full semester, full year long approach. So as we build in programs, CSLP uh, with those 35 hours, that might help one organization who has the capacity to handle one volunteer versus a community-based course might have a different partner or multiple partners to work with an entire class or a student who's getting the President's Volunteer Service Award, that's 100 hours. So maybe Ooh. they're looking for something over the summer or for the weekends. And then community-based research like cohorts or uh, capstone students they may be towards that later program that you were mentioning or ladder program that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. So it's about understanding, well, what are the needs and then really matching it to the right students and the right faculty. So as you all are hearing this, um, you know, please do send any recommendations my way because uh, I have the honestly lovely job of, of matching uh, and trying to find good partnerships. And I mean, it brings me so much joy to see when things work out like, these last, um, like the ones that you're hearing about now. I want to move into some questions. Um, I know that we can probably, what, what are we thinking, like 10 minutes? Okay, uh, so 
on the questions, I guess I can start and then I would well, love for anyone from Zoom. First. No. Yeah, does anyone from Zoom have a question that we can start with? For our uh, nonprofit representatives? Or anyone in the room? I can give one to kick us off and then while people are thinking, I would definitely love to get some from our uh, attendees, from our participants. Um, I guess what I'm curious about is with the matching volunteers process. So uh, I know both of you kind of are in different spots where mm -hmm. you're a volunteer coordinator, you're operating more as deputy director. Mm -hmm. So you, you see across programs versus with yours, you kind of know, hey, we're looking for this many volunteers and able to match. So how does the matching work? Is it more like um, matching based off of skills or is it schedules based? Or is it like you kind of send out an email internally and then see who needs the support? I would love to hear more about that. Uh, yeah, in terms of projects, I think, to be honest, I think it tends to start with the, the class. If they're reaching out, like a professor is reaching out to us and say, hey, we have this potential project offering, um, are you interested? I'll usually read the project description and see what, what uh, program director would be like applying to this or would relate to that project the most. Uh, and propose it to them and see what their thoughts are and if they have the capacity to do it or if they're interested in doing it. Um, and then we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes professors will come to me about kind of like they have a random project. They don't have a specific like deliverable yet, but they have a vision of what their class is going to be and what kinds of projects would happen. Um, and then I can kind of go to our program teams again and say like, are there any projects that you're looking to get done over the past over the next couple of months um this like these are kind of like some ideas uh and have that have our team kind of decide on what project they're looking for and so sometimes they'll do that way um but i'm really just kind of like a connector i have to be aware of all of our programs needs and like wants so um and then i'll kind of connect it through there yeah um very similarly um we usually have folks reach out to us and when they reach out we kind of put out this internal email of like hey we have this opportunity do you want to take advantage of um and that's a yay or nay but then we also do it in reverse and not necessarily in this formal setting but i think that that's probably is something that we could approach is like hey we have these four things that we're always doing or we have this major project and that's typically on our website or we put through our newsletter blast and that's typically when we do get folks um Kind of ad hoc assisting but mm -hmm. as far as from this program it has been um reaching out here are these classes here and then it's and it's a kind of mutual like oh well oh interpretation services oh i think i can let me reach out to this person and then let's see if we can put something together yeah mm -hmm. for sure yeah i would love to put something in place internally where like our program off program directors are thinking about uh, what kind of projects they want to get done ahead of time yeah and then we can like connect with classes further um but Again, honestly, you have the capacity, and get the the capacity. That. exactly yeah, that's the problem yeah, and there and the, yeah and just yeah. uh this is something that we saw with one of our school of communications courses where they received uh five hundred thousand dollars from an alumni who now is able to kind of provide support to that class to do to, mm. in a sense community-based work so i think there is a real big tie in to if we can even use this as an opportunity to create uh, tie ins through mm -hmm. alumni advancement so that they can support student like uh, engagement with nonprofits and nonprofits can count on it too. I think that's really a win for everybody involved. And, uh, you know, that's one that hopefully like we can get connected with our, our yeah. different donation networks there. Mm -hmm. Questions from? One in the I would follow just kind of to what Eva said in terms of reaching out is the best way to like reach out with kind of this question via email, reach out requesting a like brief meeting, like both. For us, it's both. I mean, usually people will reach out to me and ask for a, like a quick meeting, and that's actually I would say a better use of my time. But it's because of the way I communicate. I prefer just to do this yep, than to well. go back and forth like, because. Yep. You know, going back and forth takes a little bit more thought. For me, other people process really well in an email, and I'm like, oh, God, this takes so much thinking. So for me, that's my preferred. That's why I'm saying both, because I know other people who are like, when you email, they can get to you when they 
have the capacity to do so. I just say, catch me if you can. <laughs> so, um, and I think that that is um, the best way. And then I would say, don't take no for an answer. And this is just my experience from working. We're, so she might be too busy, I might be too busy. Find somebody else. Because it'll either get circled back to us or that person may say, ooh, I can. We've seen that with interns. This is the this is the time of year where we get a lot of intern like requests. And I'm like, I don't need an intern, move it over to somebody else. And then I'll see that. Did you get an email from so and so? It's like, oh thank goodness, I felt so bad. And then that's what ends up happening. It's not on purpose that we're ignoring an email, it's a capacity issue. So out of curiosity, do you keep your websites updated with a section that says volunteer opportunity, volunteer and internship opportunities that people start with? Typically. Yes, I agree. Yes. Yeah. We keep we keep it up to date, but I will add I, I don't put any sort of like class opportunities on the website because mm -hmm. that uh, you know, that's very specific to AU or specific to our other university partners. Yeah, that's um, the same for us. Yeah. So like, oh, you got the website? Hold up right now. <laughs> you made the participant box different or smaller. That's not me. Me? Yeah. Oh, you guys are all on the same. Somehow Sorry. I'm doing the PowerPoint and Lindsay's doing the other. <laughs> so we um, usually yeah. share this page with students mm -hmm. and Gordon's Kids has all their requirements and their interest form. Um, I try pulling up the application that we usually use, but it's closed. Yeah, it's closed right now because yeah. we don't have uh, right tutoring right happening during the summer. Mm -hmm. um, but then usually, so like if a student is interested in getting involved with our organization, um, they can read through our website and kind of get a better understanding of what we do. And then um, they can always propose something to us. Mm -hmm. I usually like to have a conversation with the professor first yeah. on like, okay, what are your class expectations? And um, kind of catch a vibe if, you know, we're on the same page on mutual beneficial relationships. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've interacted with some, uh, some partners, not necessarily professors, but um, external folks who really want to be self-serving about like their, a photo so. op yeah yeah so we don't like to work <laughs> with those kinds of uh people or organizations Fair. so um yeah it's really helpful just to have that conversation with the professor on like what your goals are and what my goals are and how we can align them together absolutely and, and making sure you're using us as a resource too because that's something that uh we try and keep a, a hand on the pulse and create those relationships so i know actually a number of our partners are trying out uh paying for like especially with corporate partnerships mm -hmm. because of the photo ops and everything they're uh having corporations paid to serve mm -hmm. and that is being like a big part of their development arm and so we hopefully have the foot in the door beforehand and are trying to create that partnership where we promise a certain number of uh engagement the other thing to keep in mind is at the beginning of the year we host a faculty community partner brunch maybe it should just be like you know uh, faculty and staff because we do have interest from other parties too so um to connect with other nonprofits in the area talk about potential projects and see what might be a good fit yeah well, that's actually the space that i've been stewing over as you've been presenting clearly when the professors have the relationship and set it up navigation is not the challenge but for other folks or professors who really want to set it up this is a weirdly, truly under-resourced, but weirdly crowded space. Mm -hmm. And those beautiful lists of organizations that you set up by 25 topics, and even in this sort of more defined space, whether it's you guys or Friendship House or mm -hmm. City Investment in Transitional Housing or Woodley House or Homeless Children's Playtime Project, right, right. you end up with this list of, and, and you just get paralyzed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it could be partly the library's responsibility. It could be let's send everybody to Snagger. But how we help folks to navigate initiating this engagement is really a tricky place. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it deserves a little bit more time. And we got a couple of winners. Mm -hmm. But I also want to think sort of systemically, what does it mean to people who are stepping not that we don't want to send everybody to YouTube, but you probably don't want us to send everybody. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. That's, yeah, that's it fair. It does take capacity to oversee these projects as well. So sometimes we do have to say no. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that is, and that, that is the thing that, that I think allowing time, the planning, I think someone else said like planning in advance and then on our side, because that's something that I can bring back is, this, is to say, 
fall is coming. Let's make this something. That's what I was going to say about the, the relationship cultivation mm -hmm. um, is developing us too mm -hmm. on how to better utilize volunteer programs. Because that's the piece that actually is probably missing. And we have a volunteer coordinator, but she's overwhelmed yeah. with all of the inquiries. So is there a thing where we say, okay, this is what, that's why she read, she actually redid our website. Cause she's just like, if they get all the information from one place, I don't have to answer emails all day. I can actually work on planning the actual mm -hmm. thing. So I think that there is something certainly symbiotic to, to happen. All right, well, thank you so yeah, much to our panelists. Uh, one more round of applause. And uh, again, yeah, the directories are a great place to, to find others. You can always come to us and we're happy to introduce you to other nonprofits. And again, thank you so much yes. for, for your time coming in and hope to see you at the fair in yeah. your capacity <laughs> as well. <Maybe>. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, now we're gonna be exploring uh, ensuring equity and reciprocity. Any partnerships and what to expect while we'll teaching in new points. Uh, so here's the timeline. Yes. Yeah. So for the community based course timeline, we start off with a uh, the designation. So this is where uh, when we started on Eagle Service and you would click the checkbox, you see it designated as a community based course. So you we post an application, we send it out out through email too. Um, if you would like to apply to designate your course as a community based course, we review that application. We set up a meeting with you to make sure that your eight criteria are uh, marked off and we'll work with you on the syllabus to um, provide you some resources of similar syllabi or ways to revise your syllabi. We then do an orientation before the start of the semester on how to integrate it with your current uh, Canvas course and the learning management tool there. Then a pre semester survey that just understands who are you working with. How are you matching students with community partners? Is there anything that we need to know? What are your class times? Pretty basic, takes about 10 minutes. And then uh, mid-semester check-in, similar sort of survey, asking if there's anything that we could be doing to support you throughout that time. And then at the end, we have the final presentation. We come and sit in on that. Uh, as it's noted in italics, faculty can request grants for food or project materials. So say your students are doing a poster presentation or um, they need funding for something that takes the work that they've done and, and really presents it um, on a wider scale. That's what the funding is is there for. And we're really thankful to that working with Washington. I think for instance, academic posters in the library costs about $20 to $30 per poster. We can pay that fee. Yeah. All right, so our expectations for a community-based course for faculty, please attend the orientation, share your syllabus with CSES, complete the three surveys across the semester. We, again, really try and be mindful to not ask you the same questions over and over again. So the total of that is about 15 minutes. Uh, the course meets the eight CV criteria, which we'll show in just a moment. There's the final presentations that detail the semester's work. They're logging their hours on gift posts, which we'll also go through in a few minutes. And there are four SET questions, student evaluation of teaching questions for uh, community-based courses or designated courses. So just being aware that that's something that will um, happen. And they'll auto every, every CV course, they'll automatically give you those scores. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here are expectations that you can have for us. We're responsive to requests and willing to receive feedback. You're not going to offend myself or anyone. Hi, Tushira. Uh, with recommendations, because that's the only way we're going to improve. We can support in finding community partners and matching. Training on the use of gift posts. We actually have weekly training sessions available as well as uh, formal orientations there. Attend, letting us attend your final presentation so we can see the great work and feel good about that too. We also provide grant funding for lifts, honorariums, final presentations, and nominating for community based associated awards. Here are the eight criteria. I'll speed through these. The first one is essentially all of the class has to be involved. It can't just be a subset of that class. Everybody in a community-based course has to be involved. If that's not what you're looking for, the CSLP is probably the better way to go and just letting your students know, hey, this is something you can optionally sign up for. Here's how in our class we're uh, kind of broaching this, but it's not fully community-based if the entire class is involved. Reciprocity as being a key characteristic of here. It's not only about what you're getting out of that relationship with the nonprofit partner, also the other way around, making sure that you're speaking to the 
So there's two handouts in the packet that might be useful. One at the bottom has the eight criteria, okay? <laughs> and the other is more of a chart. We were thinking as you, as you think about your syllabus, you could fill this in and say, oh, this is how I meet the criteria about reciprocity or critical reflection. So if you want to just like jot things down as we go along, this is like the only handout that you can actually find like practically useful. So yeah, those two handouts, so you don't have to bother taking notes. <laughs> Uh, so number three, the 20 hours of community service um, per person or the entire class being involved in a comparable sort of like deliverable project. Faculty will prepare students for community entry. So you've heard a little bit about from the faculty side how they do that. Number five, um, having ways for students to critically reflect on what they learn. We do build this in within the tracking system of gift pulse. There's an area for them to reflect. So that's built in, if anything else. Then Academic credit is given also for the classwork that they're doing. They're learning more than just, hey, going to serve. Uh, so the credit that they're getting or their grade isn't only about the service. And Seven, the faculty is submitting the grade, not the group. Correct, correct. Uh, two and seven are, are fairly uh, similar. The difference being that with seven, it's more on the education component. And two is in terms of reciprocity of the work relationship. And eight, finally, is that um, there's the evaluative feedback from students, nonprofits, and faculty. We take care of that, sending that out. It's part of why we ask during the uh, first two surveys about who was your community partner, what's their contact information. We send out an email afterwards um, just asking, how was it? What can we do to improve? Great. So just in terms of our focus, which we, should, we shouldn't have taken this long to get to, but we are at that now. Reshaping your syllabus. So this is kind of the pieces we want you to rethink as you do this. One is your learning outcomes. And we're going to show you a bunch of slides with examples. We're not going to review them all, but we'll show you what they can look like because you want to have at least one and maybe more than one learning outcome. Preparing students for community entry, we've mentioned that. Partnerships, we spent a lot of time on that piece. We'll spend a little bit of time today on tools and examples of what the critical thinking part can look like. And then the assessment too. All right, so Amanda, I think you're up on right. outcomes. Um, so I feel like we hear this often at AU, but the first thing to think about, especially when you're building syllabus or reimagining syllabus, is think about your learning outcomes and then work backwards. What major assignments, what learning experiences will help your students meet those learning outcomes? So some examples from current courses. Uh, we have two from public health, health community documentary, general idea. Um, I say set specific community learning outcomes for your course. So some examples we have here below. Students will learn how to create a community partnership that values and practices reciprocity. Example partnership that meets community partner needs and students educational objectives. Students will connect their research in the classroom, the library, and the writing process, the practical experiences in the Washington, D.C. community. Uh, so we're curious, can you think of or at least start to brainstorm an example of what a learning outcome or even learning outcome like language, uh, not to scare people to teach out their realized learning outcome language. It's pretty tough sometimes, but. <laughs> okay. um, can you imagine a way to rewrite or add a learning outcome to your syllabus that would get a community-based work while still being the learning outcomes you're in the course? So for example, the second bullet point under general learning, that's actually from one of my writing syllabus our syllabi, because the students are connecting their research in the classroom, the library, and the writing process to their experiences in the greater DC community. Um, so for instance, this was just a graphic from my syllabus. So the first page has the typical writing or CB or four learning outcomes. This infographic on the right Three overlapping circles. One is to demonstrate the reciprocity and how all the learning outcomes are interconnected, but two, I'm also explicitly stating on page two of the syllabus so students see that this is actually something they will be thinking about before. These are several learning outcomes from uh, Dr. Lubo's CAS leadership seminar. Um, so students are demonstrating servant leadership through work in the DC area. They're producing original projects in collaboration with and service to a nonprofit organization, practicing necessary skills, 
think especially about application and practice. Uh, yeah, so here are a few student testimonials from our community service learning program. Uh, we could probably skip through some of these. I'll guess uh, I'll, the first one is more on the terms of reflection, how that was impactful. The second is connecting to the different communities in DC. And the third is also around getting outside of the, the Ward 3 area uh, as something that's a new experience for them. I like that last one too, where it was just saying we had done volunteering in the past. I think now a days, it seems like a lot of students are coming from high school, having done volunteering, and now they're able to re-engage with it, but through a new light, because it's very rare that in high school, they're volunteering with an academic component attached to it. The majority of our students do have to complete required service hours for graduation. If you actually look at the research on required service, it negatively impacts almost all participants, um, volunteers, community partners, community members, all over the place. This is one reason why, for instance, CSES take a strong stand that we think experiential learning probably would make sense at some point in the AU4 curriculum as a requirement, but not specifically community learning. Some element of experiential learning in your undergraduate degree would make sense. All right, so now we want to talk about some faculty support for community learning. Uh, we'd like to highlight this section because we do have funding uh, and we would like people to use it. And I will be blowing up your email box and creating some Canvas comments this summer that people can just copy into their Canvas courses to streamline some of our prep. Um, but we'd love to have more faculty and students apply for these grants. Okay, so we spoke earlier about working with Washington and our budget. This is what our 30000 ish dollars funded. So, for instance, I'm working eight to 10 hours a week uh, in the CSIS office for 10 months, uh, working on the Marcus Table Partnership, working on faculty engagement, uh, our Carnegie Community Engagement Classification application, more. Uh, it funds my graduate students' position. Uh, so, Kyle works 19 hours a week for nine months. Uh, we are very lucky that Kyle is, maybe unfortunately for him, in a three year graduate program. So, we have him for another year. Uh, faculty microgrants. This is something we'd love for faculty to submit more applications for, whether it's food for final presentations, for community partner panels, if it's coffee, if you want to get food through AU catering, Chartwell's. Uh, shockingly, the Chartwell's food is much better than TDR food. Um, we have students' uh, testimonials to that. <laughs> um, this is also the place that you can apply for materials for projects. So academic posters, if your students need to buy supplies, if they're doing some kind of project and they need to provide the budget, we can do this sort of thing. <clears throat> the Travel Transportation Fund, one of our most popular grants. Um, it's sometimes one of the trickier ones. Um, it's what Kyle and I spent a lot of time coordinating in terms of creating lift programs um, and working with students. We funded over 95 rides this semester, almost a thousand miles. Wow. Uh, we pretty much maxed out this budget and we requested more funds for this budget because we do have a feeling the more people learn about it, the more it'll be used. The priority is board seven and eight. It's yes. not like any, you really so, want to do it where it takes so long to mine bus and metro and walking that it's prohibited. The challenge with the LIFT program is also like one, there are requirements. There is an application. Um, I can briefly show it. Um, the transportation does need to take about an hour or more. It should be for two or more students. Um, ideally, it's for Ward 7 and 8. There are simply some locations of Ward 7 and 8 that are not metro accessible. Uh, there was one location we provided transportation to this semester that it would take two and a half hours to get to public transportation, which is obviously not doable for student schedules. Um, so take me a minute with this if you okay. I think we're good. Yeah. yeah. Um, the basic idea is, though, we do want to be conscious of bias, though, because there have been requests from students who, for instance, want this to go to, say, Adams Morgan um, or Cleveland Park or some other areas where this is a little more doable public transportation wise. So it does require some of those deeper conversations with your students and more careful communication skills. Uh, the other item that we have that we have not utilized as well. Sorry, is the community partner honorarium. Uh, this is a fund where I will be very frank. We do not have any applications for you. Uh, so we have quite a bit of money here. This is for partners that have ongoing partnerships that have probably come to campus 
two plus times this year uh, or support your students in a multiple ways. So for instance, this is something that we do have this funding until the end of every June because it goes by the academic fiscal year. Um, I'll be submitting an application this summer. Uh, I know Noemi is submitting one. We encourage anyone, if you have a long-standing partnership, to please submit this honorary application. It's a small amount of money, somewhere between $250 to, I think, $400, but still for the amount of time and energy that our community partners put into these partnerships and training our students, it's at least something. I will walk you through the process. What it requires is by the university is that they become a vendor. So they have to fill out all these like tax forms in order for us to then give them check. So well, once you're ready for it, we can help walk you through. So this next section is going to be talking about Gift Pulse as a tool. So we've heard Gift Pulse mentioned a few times. It's essentially uh, easiest way to think about it is a tracking tool to track the hours that your students are spending doing their service learning projects. So it integrates with Canvas. That's one of the big changes over the semester. So we've used Gift Pulse for a few years, but uh, other institutions like GW. They use Git Post on a much grander scale. We had this basic version and the university just invested a significant contribution to upgrade our membership so that we're, we were originally limited to only using it for about two programs, not able to do project-based courses within it. Uh, now we have full access to about everything. So we can uh, create new administrators. Essentially each course acts as an administrative function. We can probably go to actually the, the next slide. Um, and this will show who benefits from Gift Pulse. Everyone kind of benefits from it and in different ways. So this all happens kind of with the uh, upgrade. So students, they, yeah. Do you have an example on how it's like showing us how we introduced? Yeah, so this? actually it's a great, <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> um, we have a dev in, uh, development environment right now. So okay. right now procurements is working with Gift Pulse, hashing out all the contract details. So they've allowed us an internal one, but uh, we have this website, American.GivePulse.com. We're still going to go through it, re-update the whole look and feel of it. And um, everyone who has an AU account has an automatic account created with GivePulse. So that's one thing that uh, is important to know. Unfortunately, you still have to do the duo push notification, but that's everything <laughs> nowadays. Uh, one of the updates, one of the updates with GivePulse is that it ties in to the back end of your rosters. So up until recently, if you've been a CD professor in the past, we've had to upload all of your students manually into Give Pulse to have them all have an account. Now it's all automatically done every day based off of your roster. So if a student drops, they will be removed from your course. If a student is added, you'll see them. You can also see a breakdown, a data visualization breakdown in a few different ways. You can see a heat map, a cluster map on where in DC are your students doing service. Uh, you can see reflections, word cloud versions of reflections. You can also see what are the issue areas that our students are engaging in. So we can see that at the individual level, at the macro level. It's really cool from that data perspective. It's one of the reasons that we ended up going with the premier version. The way that this works for a nonprofit is very interesting as well. They have access to this for free. So they can create an account for free. It's a volunteer uh, management tool for them. And then they verify hours. They are sent a notification. Did this person do X, Y, Z? It sends them a reflection and they verify, yes, they did this. No, they didn't do this. So um, not only does that, like if they post a volunteer opportunity, not only does it submit it to AU, it posts it for all of the different universities around the DMV that use gift goals. So it provides a way to market volunteer opportunities or other events for nonprofits, as well as uh, allows them to get more volunteer up, volunteers from various universities. So yeah, this is the Gift Pulse page. Um, I know on my admin access and everyone, again, uh, we were limited to only two administrators. We will have unlimited administrators with this new upgrade. Uh, we could go back to the present, the PowerPoint. Yep. This is, so uh, we, we will do uh, in August, a full, just like 90 minutes on just Gift Pulse. How do I tie it to my Canvas course? Um, where can I go for more resources? We do also have a gift post page, one made for students, one made for community partners with training videos. And we like 
took screenshots, did step-by-step -step directions. How do I create an account? How do I track my hours, et cetera? So this is also one of the things that we will be adding to Campus Commons this summer. So ideally, like the Lyft grant application, like some other CDL resources, you can just add this to your course instead of having to reinvent it. Yeah, and in full transparency, this is like the tip of the iceberg. I'm go like uh, part of a boot camp, so to speak. Uh, six weeks learning all about how from a university level we can maximize this use. So the things I'm speaking to now are a little bit of what they've told me, but there's going to be plenty more too. From a student's perspective, it generates co-curricular transcript that not only tracks all of the service that they've done, but it works with Engage, which is if you've noticed like students have this Quark app on their phone, they're like, what do I do at 5 p.m.? Is there a cheese club? Uh, I would like to go taste some cheese. So they... Um, can't, there's this tab called service on that. And as nonprofits we affiliate with, who are formal community partners, uh, post opportunities on the Give Pulse page, it will populate as well on their core cap. So they can see volunteer opportunities and sign up straight that way. And it gets recorded in this co-curricular transcript that also is counting what they're doing outside of the classroom with clubs, et cetera. Uh, the hours are automatically sent for verification, and they can be recorded in multiple programs. So if your student is a CB student, also taking CSLP, also going for the President's Volunteer Service Award, all of that can be tracked in one click. And it's shared, that impact is shared with the nonprofit. So a nonprofit can see their overall impact and their contribution by their volunteers. Um, I think I honestly went over most of this, and we will have the full 90 minutes on in August. Uh, so look forward to that by attending this, you will get more information on, on the upcoming one in August. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay. All right. Um, sorry, go ahead. Is there a question? Just a quick question. I, mean, I know it's only about the team, but is Give Pulse something that's only for the DMV area? No. So it actually started in Texas, uh, and it's that's where it's the biggest right now is um, the different universities around Texas. DC has quite a lot, but no, it's it's global, and it's uh, one that they build themselves not only for service learning, but educate. Uh, sorry, experiential learning a little bit more broadly too. Um, so happy to connect. So in you. theory, if a kid from AU wanted to do something over the summer mm -hmm. in their hometown, yes, mm -hmm. then they could look on this site in order to go and exactly. So with the press. Uh, yes, and that's sort of also based off of how we've affiliated, but we have one organization, for example, PALS, PA, uh, they work with um, with those who suffer or who, who have Down syndrome and do camps. So they train uh, counselors for the camps. They're spread out all over the U.S. So they have like one in Baltimore, one that's at Georgetown, uh, quite a few in New York, Colorado, New York, or sorry, uh, California. and that's 100 hours over one week. So if a student is trying to get the President's Volunteer Service Award and that's 100 hour minimum, they don't have to do that service in DC. They just have to tag it and get it verified. And so Give Pulse is what we use to track their progress towards the President's Volunteer Service Award, um, as well as everything that's kind of more domestic. Yeah, some cool. student populations are already using it across the university for other co-curricular aspects. So it's not something unknown to students, but they're gonna need some. Yeah. yeah all of us, all of us will because it's like the faculty updates are brand new and really exciting. However, the faculty update to it will make grading very easy. Yeah. It'll just pop up the best skip polls page on campus, complete and complete move on. Yeah. All right. So we want to talk about preparing students for community engagement. We've talked about this in different ways, um, but we wanted to highlight some different options here. Um, so really quick. We want to do some discussion. What kind of background knowledge do you think students would need to work with the community? Specifically community partners you may want to work with. Or just DC. What do you think, you know, first year or second year students need to know about DC before they call redlining? Mm -hmm. Redlining, free segregation. I think the list of what would be interesting and useful is very long. I also don't think it has to be a big bound, uh, barrier. Yeah. I think getting up out there and then figuring out the question is yeah. okay too. Definitely. Uh, I, there is some logistical orientation and dress code and timing, but 
the idea that I have to be totally informed before I go do something that, that gets me something to do. And what students focus on is going to be different. Like I've had students that get more interested in learning about food deserts, and then others are more interested in, for instance, the equity issues and racism that shapes the Anacostia River. But let's go to the next. I'll show you what I think is kind of basic. Like this is a map of DC. DC has about 700,000 people. If there are eight wards, what ward are we located in at AU? You know, what's the Anacostia River? And the demographics and a little bit of, you know, how they have changed. So to me, this is like useful basics to know that we're not a multi, we're not millions and millions of people. We're a relatively small city. But where we're located, and, and then again, some of the inequities you'll see if you live in Ward 3 versus Ward 6, 7, 8. Um, I'm a big fan. There's some materials on our Canvas page, but there are some Google overlay maps that you can play with now that'll show different income levels, uh, breakdown by gender, race, cars. Students are often stunned when they see that the average income level in Ward 3, for instance, is somewhere over 150,000. And the average income level in wards seven and eight is usually around 20,000. Actually, that's in slide 77. And, and the Office of Planning, which is an awful website and not easy to find, but has terrific ward by ward reports that include the assets of every okay. ward. It's mm -hmm. not just that they're poor and struggling and food yes. deserts, they mm -hmm. have real strengths as yes. well. Sure. Good point. Good point. Uh, so, speaking of the AU library, you're a fan of two of these subject guides, DC history and local area studies. So you screwed the clues, screenshot of that. I'm a big fan of the anti-racism subject guide. It's been a huge project um, from our AU librarians and our regular studies program, um, especially some of the bias, racism, and equity issues our students struggle with as they're learning about anti-racism and how it is a constant process it is not an end goal. I always say to my students, they're not giving out certificates in anti-racism. It's something that you should be doing constantly every single day. Um, these are two great resources from the AU library and from our own staff that we highly encourage you to use. We sometimes have Olivia Ivy come into a class and help students understand. Oh, yeah. if, if you want to have librarians come in, we would love it. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. It's great. All right. Uh, so then we also, especially since COVID has changed so much, um, sharing updated data. You want to speak to this? Well, I'm already looking at 2020 is already three years ago, so it might be a little bit outdated. We got to update this. But yeah, you can just see the disparities in terms of a family income. So, but if we all, we've also had at times slides about food disparities, access, you know, we all know that affordable housing in DC is practically non existent, right? But, you know, all those issues are important. But again, depending on what the class is, you might emphasize different things. So then our suggestions, especially gain local context. Um, so orientation, uh, we deeply encourage using different maps of DC. Uh, again, especially since it's an interactive activity that you can do in class or you can build another assignment about it. A big fan of those overlay maps that you can search. Uh, we also encourage students to start using, they have subscriptions, they don't often know this, to the Washington Post through the university library. Show them how to log in. Add a link to your say what? In the New York Times <laughs> and the Wall Street Journal. And the financial. Yes. Yep. Here's a brochure. I have it in my office and I can't believe I forgot to bring it. Cultural tourism DC. Have you ever seen those? They're like walking tours and nice brochures, but you can also say, you know, I used to take my students out to Mount Pleasant and you walk down the street and like these little historical markers with photos. And it just gives you a lot of context and history in terms of what's changed. And they're actually free, so you can order them, or you can borrow them from us, or you can look at them online. Um, we encourage community mapping activities. A number of different classes are doing this now. Um, also, visiting community garden, theater, or market, um, especially when I do that initial commute with my students, to Gordon's kids, or their community partner at the beginning of the semester. We often talk about what are the different community organizations that we're seeing, what are the different businesses that we're seeing, how is this different than AU, uh, my students are frequently amazed at how many schools, churches, and community organizations are on Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. Um, they're also surprised at how many people are walking around every single day, which is very different than the narrative they've heard about Anacostia from many of their AU classmates. So, 
one of the things we do within our CSLP orientation is also asking where is everybody else from and it, how does it, like what's yeah. different about DC? Because educating on DC is kind of one thing, but also just connecting it to, well, what is the normal for them and how might this be different? One of the, the, the questions that you actually asked Vicky earlier is informing this next orientation because I had never thought about introducing students to what is the structure of a nonprofit generally like governance wise. So I think that's one that I, I'm definitely going to start to add in. So thanks for, for bringing that up. Well, and the other one that's fun is in the DC History Center is on top of an Apple store. So if they need to go to an Apple store, spend huh. some time visiting the exhibits. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. beautiful at the current And the DC History Center is another fantastic, they do great events, they have a publication. That's a, that's a great example of, you know, a resource that we can tap into. I believe that Public History Department, Dan Kerr, has a very strong partnership with them and at their conference had plenty of AU participation, right? Uh, the other one, which is not on here, but I increasingly send students to nonprofit and community social media. Uh, they're mm -hmm. on social media, they're using Twitter, especially and Instagram. They're using some uh, nonprofits and community organizations on TikTok. I am a TikToker, mm -hmm. um, but they're getting information from this and it's accessible. So let's also meet them where they are. Okay, uh, logistics. This is sort of a messier place, which can be time consuming. Um, these are sort of our best practices. So especially COVID related, we are it, entering in endemic stage. So a number of people have already updated vaccine requirements, um, but we're, we especially encourage students to, if you feel sick, test. Um, I, especially I'm a DC resident, I live in Brightwood. Uh, I honestly stocked up. We have something like 60 rapids in my basement. I would just like do laps, pick them up from the libraries, and I carried them around my teaching bag and I have a stack in my office. So especially students couldn't get the machines to work on campus and we won't have access to that next year. I want them to be able to go to tutoring if possible or if they're more comfortable. Encourage your students to test the curriculum. Um, we deeply encourage working with students actively in class to determine the best routes to organizations. Um, navigating DC Metro, our students are big fans of using Google Maps, Apple Maps, uh, the different transportation applications. We have a Canvas Commons page that I would like to share this summer that shows some examples from my own assignments, but I think especially having students practice this, there will be a day that the red line is most literally on fire, so they will need a backup plan. Um, the lift, Option two, while that sounds obvious, they have to opt in, and we've had some student uh, questions and confusion about it. Students don't often understand why we need to do an orientation with them to show them how to do it, but the students who've had confusion and questions now are like, oh, this is why I should have gone to the orientation. So we also encourage, if your students are using LIT, would you please attend the orientation and respond to my graduate assistant who's doing that. Um, Does it cover the driving if they have to for the Yes. Yes. Our students aren't used to rush hour and off peak things. So especially we encourage them during rush hour, it's probably gonna be easier to go somewhere public transportation wise. Some of my students realized that their classmates who are using public transportation were actually getting to Anacostia sooner than the people using Lyft because of rush hour traffic, depending on the day. Um, this is also something to keep in mind, especially with students in Lyft. There've been a couple of usually Lyft to Anacostia is anywhere between 45 to $65. There was one last semester that was 140. Um, there was some big event on Capitol Hill, um, but yes, just be cognizant of these aspects. Um, especially when we're talking to students about Lyft and we're trying to be cognizant that this is a budget for the entire university. Uh, we also try to say like be cautious or be aware of what classmates are going with you and how we can consolidate trips. Um, Safety tips, our students, we've increasingly seen this since we came back in person in fall of 2021. Uh, students and their parents are very concerned about safety. Um, so the way I phrase it to students is, public safety is a concern in every single major US city right now. DC is not different. It may look different in Ward 7 and 8 than it does in Ward 3, but unfortunately we have all learned this year that even things happen on campus. Uh, so we talk about things like if you are wearing headphones, maybe don't wear headphones or wear one. If you can leave your laptop at home, leave your laptop at home. Um, we, a former volunteer coordinator for Friends Kids, like to say, for instance, think about the environment that you're entering, the audience. Probably don't walk in with your $6 Starbucks cup 
for your Louis Vuitton handbag, probably think about dressing and modeling the same kind of behavior that you would want if touring. So even like when I do the trip with my students, I'll wear jeans, I'll wear a button down shirt, I'll wear a hoodie or a fleece, just something that would be typical to what they tend to be wearing. Um, safety tips, I also encourage them to look around like how are they noticing how cops um, are behaving? For instance, if you come out Anacostia Metro, there are cops, sometimes Homeland Security there every single day. And our students are aware of this. Um, so also again, in terms of safety, be cognizant of where they're moving. Um, again, clothing, we joked about the crop top rule, but it is very much an issue. Um, encourage your students to dress professionally and appropriately for the situation. Uh, apparently this is something, especially if they're taking internships or doing practicums, they're talking about too. This is not something I felt really anxious telling students what to wear and not to wear. And they were like, no, this is fair. Um, and a number of nonprofits, especially that work with children have told us in the last year, they've even had to ask students to like put on a shirt if they're wearing a sports bra under a hoodie, but the hoodie's not zipped or they won't zip the hoodie. Mm -hmm. um, children have put their like fingers up, ripped jeans. So again, like some of those things that would just be everyday college student clothing, just have those conversations with them. Um, expe abolishing expectations around behavior and attitude while interacting with community partners. This is a tough one and it's going to be different based on each community member and each organization. Um, but we really try to encourage one listening, getting to know the community partner, uh, not making assumptions. This is often especially hard for younger students to assume, for instance, there was a well-intentioned, lovely student in one of my classes this year who, when a child of friends' kids was explained that they were going to visit dad this weekend, she's like, oh, that's so great. Like, you got to be really excited. And the kid was like, no, I don't like visiting my dad. Like, he lives in the more dangerous side of Anacostia. We can't leave the apartment. We just sit in the apartment all weekend. Like, it's not a fun visit. And my student was like, I assume way too much because she assumed that seeing her dad was like a party all weekend. So, um, talking through some of those things, we deeply encourage, again, having your students listen, find out more about the community before assuming. Uh, students need, I'm a big proponent of come up with a handout, uh, something even they could save on their phone. If they are running late for tutoring, who should they text? They should probably text Kiana. Uh, if they are doing something with a research person, what is their email? So being really clear about if they can't go, if they're sick, who do they contact? What are the ways of doing this? What's the best way to give notice? Um, and then the other one, some sites that work with youth require background checks or TB tests, allow time for doing this. Um, I'm at the point, and so is Horton's kids with especially paperwork that again, I'm gonna make this great assignment in the fall because it's just taking too much time. Um, TB test, the health center can do this. Yes, you can answer it for us. Yeah. Um, most students understand this. A number of community partners, I've had a couple of students in the last couple of years been nervous about things like uh, parking violations, speeding tickets, they're not looking for that. Uh, a majority of nonprofits are also not worrying about minor drug offenses. Um, I've had a few students who have been arrested for marijuana and simply it is 2023 and that is not something that is going to be flagged with a background check anymore. So, um, any additional ideas? Or questions or concerns. This is most certainly, I think, one of the messier parts about teaching to be. And it's going to be different again based on your students, the populations that you're working with, the age of your students, their own identities. Yeah, my big safety tip is on the metro, especially, but everywhere else is uh, students just get stuck in their phones and they're looking down all the time. Yeah. And um, that's actually a pretty common robbery. Yeah. The yeah. city is grabbing your phone while you're on the metro and holding down the door. So. I tell them don't be all consumed in your phones. That's, That's hard. Point. So it's totally yeah, right. Right. How do you go around uh confidentiality stuff? Like for example, like I learned kids, if they're if a kid is disclosing mm. their sexual identity or something like that, like okay. How do you have those things? So right. our students, depending on the nonprofit, are not mandated reporters. The staff at Horton's Kids is. So one example, a student told, a uh, Horton's kid's child told one of my students this spring that they were gonna be beat because of something when they went home. We don't know what that means. We can't assume what that means. My student reported it to center staff, center staff dealt with it. 
there was a more serious issue in the fall where CPS did need to get involved. Um, it was related to sexual abuse. It was a lot worse. Uh, the student again reported it immediately. Uh, he actually had to talk to a detective and give a statement. Um, because of confidentiality, we don't exactly know what happened with that family. Uh, they don't attend programming anymore, um, but it was referred to CPS. The general idea, especially in academic assignments in terms of confidentiality, I always say choose a culturally appropriate but different name child. So for instance, if child's name is Sagar, Sam, to preserve their privacy. Uh, same with community members. I mean, if you're doing the written assignment, yes. about it and um, yes. uh, Same with pictures. Pretty much every single nonprofit that we work with, students cannot take pictures with them. This is common sense to some students, but it, students have posted things on social media before, um, especially depending on the group that you're working with. Um, children under 18, we don't have parents that to take their picture. Uh, if you're going to mark this table, you may not want people seeing your picture on social media and knowing that you use a meal program. If you're in a DV shelter, you most certainly don't want pictures taken of you. Um, so that's sort of a black and white rule there, especially with confidentiality and privacy, no pictures. They could take pictures of themselves at programs. They could ask a staff member to, I think it's the safest way, so there is no question, um, but really nothing with the children. We also talk a lot, actually this is another good thing, especially in terms of privacy, boundaries. Uh, so we often talk about like what are appropriate boundaries. This often comes up with my students um, because the children want to play with the hair of the white women they're volunteering. Um, it's different than the black children, abhorrent kids. Um, and students are increasingly uncomfortable with this. And even staff are saying like, you don't have to. So I also say to them like, if you don't want that, put your hair in a ponytail, like put it in a bun, put it up and also say to them and model for them Children are learning about consent even earlier too. This is a part of consent. You don't have to let someone hug you, touch your hair, any of these things. But again, this is a more challenging conversation, especially younger college students. They don't always feel comfortable doing this. But the way I found, if I frame in terms of consent and how they consent, it clicks in a different way. I don't know if that helps. So. Is there anything about like creating class um, contract sheets and helping them figure out how to coordinate that. I create a Microsoft form and they fill out their name, their uh, community partner, what they they volunteer, phone numbers. I say very strictly because this has been a concern in the past. Uh, the contact info is for our class only, so I do not care if your roommate is convinced in our class with the love of their life. Uh, you may not share that phone number. Um, the contact sheets are very much just for our class to coordinate transportation. So. Another thing that came up a few years ago, not recently, was a staff member at the nonprofit was kind of inappropriate with one of our students. The students need to know, like, let us know, and we will deal with that. And in some cases, the staff member has actually, you know, texting pictures or just crossing certain lines, either been put on probation or lost a job because they really were crossing the line. And, you know, with college students, that might not be totally uncommon. So, but students need to know, you need to let us know. You're the authority. I also say my students, something uncomfortable is going to come up this semester. Mm -hmm. So I think the more that you can build that rapport so they're open to coming and talk to you about it. Um, the young man that had to report sexual abuse, he was really uncomfortable, but he texted me. He's like, I have a feeling this is like an emergency that I should text you about. And I was like, Cool. Let's talk on the phone. We talked. I was like, "Did you report?" He's like, "Yes," but I'm trying to figure out what else you did. I was like, "At this point, you've done everything. We can send a follow-up email, confirm if they need more information." He cooperated with the detectives, the CPS. In that case, do you refer them to our campus coordinator? Yes. So um, that student, my program leader for complex problems, was actually nervous that he may have had some sexual abuse due to he actually got like physically ill at programming that day. Uh, so we talked, he said, you know, partially just for pride. I asked, would you like me to do a care report? Would you like to do this? He was okay with this. Um, there, especially with our students increasing uh, anxiety and mental health concerns post at this stage of COVID, this is something I think you have to be really clear about. So I also think modeling, connecting services outside of our classroom 
it's not a bad thing. Their tuition dollars are paying for this. So, uh, sorry, my computer stopped working again. So give me one sec. What other questions about logistics and planning do we have? Just going to say for the community service learning program, that participation agreement that we have, it's generated half by student responses. So it might ask them, like, what parts of the course that you're taking are connecting to the work that you've outlined with the nonprofit, right? So, and then I'll fill in a little bit of section in terms of expectations or goals. So if anyone wants to see what that looks like in terms of like just the raw sample document, happy to share that and even incorporate anything in terms of advice or safety requirements, anything that you all want to add. Don't um, be dissuaded from having a CSLP student just because the paperwork, uh, there, if, if there's anything on that end too, happy to be uh, amenable there. Sorry, it's me for me to relaunch soon. I'm going to shut down and get me out of here. There we go. Okay, I could also um, keep going if that's easier. Uh, I think we are back in business. I think we've gone through most of the mm -hmm. elements on this slide. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so now we're on to critical thinking and reflection. Just one of our favorite parts. So four states of critical reflection. We're believers and it should be continuous, connected, challenging, contextualized. So by continuous, it should be happening all throughout the semester. Critical reflection can't just be one assignment at the beginning of the semester or one assignment at the end. It needs to be modeled in formal and informal ways throughout the course. So that might mean you're doing something, a formal graded assignment, like I am in my conference promise class three times a semester, but you're also building in warm-up discussion at the beginning of class. You come into class, five, 10 minutes. How's tutoring going this week? How's your research project going? What challenges are people encountering? They're great warm-up questions. They also build classroom community really quickly. Uh, connected, often having community partners participate in reflection, especially when they are doing trainings. More of our community partners are building in reflection organically. Uh, reflection should be challenging. It is not just a journal entry. It is not just talking about your feelings. Uh, there's plenty of research on critical academic reflections. I'm happy to share some here on the Canvas page already. But this is really what changes the learning and community-based learning. This is where the learning happens, when students are thinking, reflecting, but also integrating the academic text. So for instance, in the critical academic reflection assignments that I have, and I have a couple of examples linked in here, um, the students have to integrate at least one to two course texts. So they might be integrating uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum's article, Complexity of Identity. It's a common article that many of us use to talk about different identities and intersecting dominance of learning identities. Uh, but they also might have to integrate their actual tutoring experience or volunteering experience. And then it needs to be contextualized based on your community partners. So the same kinds of materials that I share on, for Horton's kids in my complex problems class, I don't always share the same things with my writing class because they're working with four different partners. So I'm trying to also find different ways to individualize the pre-service training and contextualize how the reflection is working based on the community partner, which takes time. So in terms of personal preparations, uh, we encourage students to share personal experiences and concerns about the upcoming work. So individually in small groups and online journal, gift polls, the reflection aspect is built in. Uh, so it's something that more of us can be using actively in the fall. We should be facilitating activities in class to assist students in understanding their identity, privilege, and culture, to prepare them for working with others with diverse backgrounds. Um, again, we have students who have been talking about race and racism and identity and privilege every single day of their lives. And others were quite sure they are not racist, but have never been in a diverse place. Um, I always come back to that every two year first year student survey. And there's a question on there about how diverse of a place is AU. And unsurprisingly, the answers are, this is the most diverse place I've ever been in. This is the least diverse mm -hmm. place I've ever been in. And a whole lot of in between. Uh, and the responses that they've gotten anecdotally from students that they followed up with are all over the place. So again, not even just, I think the other thing that we assume sometimes is that BIPOC students may have more experience talking about identity and privilege, but especially to attend AU, 
you often have to have a certain amount of privilege to begin with. Um, so also not making assumptions on the kind of preparation your student might need based on their perceived identities. Um, so we have a reflection activities handout, which I believe is in the I zip file. I actually didn't make copies of it. So if you want it, you can either email me or we can post it online. It's like eight pages of activity, like a lot. But <laughs> if it's appealing, let me know and I'm happy to send it. And for CSLP, that final academic reflection, we also provide uh, one page of here are, here's the outline of CSLP. Here are some examples of final refle or academic reflections. Feel free to pick one of those. Otherwise, that blog uh, component is kind of our standard default. This is also the space where how we hold trauma, small t, in our bodies and mindfulness or physical activity. I don't know how anybody teaches a three hour course. But for those of you who do to have something physical as part of it can feed into this sort of reflection and preparation. Mm -hmm. The uh, new co-curricular we did with my class this semester, which was wildly popular based on end of semester evaluations, was the trauma-informed training for Gordon's kids. They did it in class. Uh, they talked about how trauma shows up for children, how it shows up for adults, how it affects all of us mentally, emotionally, physically. Mm -hmm. um, we also do, an in another co-curricular is an inclusive yoga class. It was actually taught by Stefan and CDI. Um, but they also talk about spending time in their own bodies and how does this feel. Some of them even talked about how they started thinking about their own bodies on the commute. Like, how do they operate on the commute? How do they behave? How do they move in different spaces, depending on the spaces? So I think the more that we can also think about embodied rhetorics and how we're embodying this work physically with our students, the better. Yeah. All right, so then we have examples of different reflection activities and assignments. The big thing that we wanna emphasize here is reflection, again, shouldn't just be one thing. It can be many different examples throughout the semester. So for instance, reflections or journals, uh, class discussions and presentations, written essays and papers, directed readings and writings, uh, case studies, think, pair, share. Students love to do the beginning of the semester. I often, especially when we're doing the informal class reflections and warm up, I'll give three to four questions on the slide. They'll have a few minutes to talk, warm up, try out some ideas. Especially in community-based learning class, more students are saying they're anxious about feeling wrong or sounding racist in the classroom, which I have different thoughts on. But the think-pair-share model does seem to at least break down some of the anxiety and get people a little more eager to share. Uh, photo essays and portfolios, online discussions, blogs, journals, and social media. Um, Sorry, I'm from writing studies, but we talk a lot about multimodal rhetoric right now. And a majority of the assignments that we've seen today from that video for visual literacy to some of the examples I have linked here, they're all multimodal assignments. The more that we can be thinking about different ways to demonstrate our students learning at community learning courses, the better. Um, and they're probably doing multimodal assignments in their other courses, whether it's a presentation or a video, a Canvas slide, an infographic, an academic poster. Um, we had, a student this semester built a model of an emotional learning and model, which models how yeah. students, it was really Gosh, Honestly, yeah, some of those ones were, were some of the most unique ways to take what they saw in their experience and bring it back into how they could use it. Like you could tell with that one who was doing it with their hands, they're like, I'm interested in the science. I'm interested now in like kind of resiliency and coaching and things like that. This is something I'm going to always carry forth with me. And then, yeah, there was another who did like almost a comic strip, another who did like a book, a literally a make, books. yeah, a couple of children's books. There was a full on like Twitter, um, social media kind of feed that they made that was like from the viewpoints of different audiences. The creativity within the students is, um, comes to light through experiential learning if that space is provided for them, which is one of these things where originally like we were doing this vlog and asking them for the vlog so we could, share it too and now i'm like okay honestly let me take a step back see what they come up with and for cslp and i think that's something that's gonna give us even more uh so this is linked in the powerpoint um but we have for instance examples of former or previous multiple narrative projects students have done assignment sheets from reflections you're welcome to borrow steal whatever you'd like mm -hmm. um reflection response rubric because students are often confused on how they're graded on our rubric. I say to them, if I'm asking them to do a multimodal assignment sheet, my assignment sheet better also be multimodal. <laughs> so this is actually an assignment sheet that I created using Canva. 
for their final project, and it links to examples of former creative projects, all their due dates. Obviously, we're excited because we cite our sources. Uh, the other thing from the library, and this is on our Canvas page too, uh, Ashley Rocamo and some other librarians are working with us on the digital research tools. So for instance, we talked earlier about the Simple Studio. We have some information here, equipment borrowing. So students can now borrow AV equipment from the library. This is the oh. same option that SOC students have had for years, and the library is making this accessible to everybody now. Uh, there's a video animation lab. There's some other options over here. Large scale poster printing. There's also, if you Google American University academic posters, the library page will pop up. This is also something that we're going to have a Canvas Commons about this summer. So, again, you won't have to create all these materials from scratch. You can hopefully just insert the Canvas Commons page into your page. Uh, questions on different types of reflection assignments? You cannot tell us is what I nerd out about. I get really excited about this. And I think there's so many different options depending on what your course is. It's one of those things that's good to nerd out about because the projects that come out of it, like I'm speaking quite honestly, they're, they're some of the best uh, distillations of learning that I've seen. So you do a really good job with those, Amanda. And maybe, to, and I only learned about it from your workshops last week, but the uh, core folks that are digging deep into assessment around inquiry versus content. There may be some resources you want to add. So CORE is very excited about this. Pretty much any AU CORE class is using a lot of uh, similar language and models. So I have a feeling more of our courses may be shifting or may be encouraged. So, all right. Uh, assessment and grading. <clears throat> all right. Do you want to walk us through this one? Yeah. So these are, I think earlier was mentioned that there are four SET questions, student evaluation teaching. Uh, for a CV course. So here are the four. Um, this is also sent during the, like it's one of those things when you're looking at the eight criteria, it's listed on the application. So if anyone has any feedback on these, let us know. I did find out we can change these. Uh, it's something that we hope to look back at to just evaluate our CV courses internally, but that's about all that it's used for. And they're all, um, None of these are open ended. These are all on that kind of scale response. As far as we know, these four questions are not being uh, tied to reappointment information. Yeah. Within you. We know that's a concern. So, the community partner survey, this is what the next slide is going to show actually. So, uh, yeah, here's an example. We, what we've tried to do, and we're kind of like revising this every year, is asking about what are some of the skills like that? So what as a nonprofit organization have you asked students to do? What are the skills that they're developing? Um, and then also asking some things about their identity character more so like, is the student dependable? Are they responsive to emails? What are some of the challenges that you faced? So the next slide is a bit of feedback from this year's survey. So about 80% of our community partners have said, we would like to continue working with AU students. Uh, and zero responded that they wouldn't. So mm -hmm. it's definitely they they want us to get more involved. Um, maybe the everyone else was yeah on the maybe side. Then ninety percent offered of the community partners offered a uh, orientation either to the organization, the community that they worked with, or the work that they did, the issue area that they worked with it. Um, and here here's a testimonial from one of the nonprofits uh, from actually the. Uh, the uh, raising a village. That's what RAV stands for. So I appreciate uh, CSS providing my students a lift pass. Um, again, this is something that's really popular so that they could travel safely to and from the site. Um, proposed improvements, this came from actually this year's survey. So sharing the AU semester calendar with the nonprofit or uh, the your point of contact at the nonprofit so that they can know spring break is this time we don't really think about that if we're just now working with university students. Uh, having clear expectations for volunteers. So this is one of those things that they really enjoyed about the participation agreement is that there's this two-way, hey, this is exactly what we're hoping to get from you, and this is what you can expect for from us. And then more opportunities for volunteer recruitment. This is one where we have the fair. Uh, once a semester, they've asked for us to host it potentially more often. And I think one of the things that Melissa uh, who was on that faculty panel was mentioning was the bringing in alumni to kind of like 
talk to students about how they've been able to grow and develop within these spaces. I think that offering more panels directed at students uh, within the, the nonprofit space is useful. So uh, this year, there was one on, um, they've started an, an uh, systemic violence summit. And um, I think that that's one way that we were able to bring in a few community partners. I know it wasn't as well attended this year, but hopefully every year, I think they're changing the topic Lisa on that. Lisa Hershey, does anybody know her? She's a new job. She has a program called Alumnus in the Classroom. Oh, yeah. She's with the Office of Alumni Engagement, okay. I think. Yeah. 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 Okay, no. so it's not HR, it's Alumni Engagement. Yeah. So she has a direct way. It's a really deep system where you could, it's not just nonprofits like we're talking about, but alums who are doing interesting work, and she'll help you bring them into your class. So. On the evaluation side, we are trying to work with the summer transition survey as well as the, the senior graduating survey to capture what percentage of our students are entering into nonprofit work after, what are the list of employers um, so that we can continue to create partnerships with them, as well as seeing what percentage of students are entering in with volunteer experience uh, and who are committed to work that builds the community. So those are some of the things that we're hoping to get starting next year um, that would let us know more about our students. And then hopefully we'll present that data uh, every so often when we have our, our conferences. Great. Okay. So this is also where it gets a little challenging. Um, again, we think starting with your courses learning outcomes, looking at the major assignments, and then thinking how does community based learning fit into all of this. Uh, so we gave a sample breakdown here. Um, if you want more examples, we have several examples on our Canvas page for community practice. Uh, we'll talk more about the community practice in a few. Um, there are many different ways to do this. Usually the way it works for most of my classes, reflection is usually about 30% of the grades so split between three different assignments. Um, there's service hours. I've actually made that a pass fail grade for the last few semesters, complete, incomplete, 10%, but you won't pass the course without that 10% complete grade. It's also a good way for them to keep track of their hours through GitPulse. Um, class participation, uh, discussion questions, myriad of options. Not every assignment has to go back to community based learning, but we think probably two to three. Um, and most certainly the final assignment should have some of it. I think we've done this one already. Yeah. So these are just some of the key areas we are advocating for stronger visibility and recognition of CBLR. Definitely, we're the liaison. We get tons of emails from nonprofits. We like our support. We can't always, I mean, we always respond and we try and connect them either with a professor or a course or say at least post it on Gift Also post it on nonprofit directly. We get a lot of requests. One thing to note is that um, as of last year's US News and World Reports, AU was ranked 17th uh, in the US for service learning. So that's a number that we're hoping to improve. Uh, yeah. And community-based courses as well, CSLP, both of those feed into that. So these next two slides are just about, from what we're hearing from faculty, you know, we have been really trying to be more con conscientious about how to support the nonprofit sector in significant ways, and also recognize that for faculty, it's a lot of work. So just some examples here is like, you know, Latin American News Center wants to come onto campus and run their summer camp and use three classrooms. And you're trying to get them like free space on campus. It is hard because space in the summer is a profit making opportunity for AU. So it's really hard to say, you know, for five weeks, give them a couple classrooms, but we're pushing for it. Definitely, we got the community partner honorarium through that grant. We have tried to say, if you're doing a CB course, you know, we, we limit class size to 20, because obviously, if, you know, if you're in a 40 or 50 person class, that's a lot for a faculty member to oversee. Uh, recognition and awards. We also, if, if you have something fantastic happening, we'll write to UCM, University of Communications and Marketing, or Julia Gibson, who's the media person, and make sure you get some coverage, because that, that helps. Um, and there have been a few articles about some of these significant programs. Um, you know, we also hear on the academic side what the library can do and what kinds of uh, validation and what kinds of 
who contributes to, what do you, what's that category of service to the university, right? Like some of the services. Yeah, like we have this community practice. Why can't that count as service to the university? We're going to meetings. Obviously, experiential learning, we're tapping into that as loud and clear as we can. Uh, and also, we're, we're also hearing recommendations that students should be exposed to 84 to experiential and CBL opportunities right away. And um, the thing about employment is really important because our students leave college with so much debt. So if we can show that there is a link to this work and getting a job, that's a big, big plus. And we have a great um, database of alums working in DMV, and there's probably a much bigger one that someone else could, could help us with. But the next slide shows some ex examples of people who were working. I think it's the next one, right? Yeah. And yeah, for these three alums that you know I've stayed in contact mm -hmm. with who are working in local organizations, either as founders. Some of you probably know Donald Curtis. He graduated from my office, and he, then he created Seoul. Romina's about to go to law school, but she's a paralegal with kids in need of defense, and Queen has worked in a whole bunch of capacities. But it's much bigger than this. So both in terms of showing the link to employment and also bringing some of these students onto campus, whether it's for an individual class or maybe a cross-campus event for all CBL courses. That's yeah, I was just about to mention it's a significant portion of nonprofit representatives. They're retained in nonprofit fields uh, because it counts for the yeah, public student work. Public forgive student student students. Students. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so more of us are talking about it, especially to our older students. Um, uh -huh. I'm also being very clear with them. I was like, I have significant student loan debt from my very fancy AU graduate degree. Um, but it will most likely be forgiven this August. Like this is actually happening. So mm -hmm. there is hope. Okay, so this is our big resource page. The big one that I want to highlight on this page, we have a community practice for community-based learning interested faculty and staff. And we will invite all of you to join it now and then you can yeah. accept or not. Yeah. Um, it's a class that you can self-enroll in, so you can click it. Uh, we already have a number of resources, different syllabi materials, examples of this year's grants. Please do not share those grant links. We will have fresh grant links for the fall because they need to be separated by semester and year. Um, this is also where we'll highlight what are our resources in Canvas Commons. So at least you can take a look at them and then go to Canvas Commons, decide what you want to copy or not copy into your individual courses. It's a great resource. I would like more of us to use it. Yeah. Um, just, especially just my big the... thing is we all get so many emails. Sorry. And to yeah. keep going back and email to find a file or this or that, using the resources that we have through Canvas just makes more sense. And so, with the Canvas, I just want to mention that we highly recommend if you, you know, as you update your syllabus to incorporate this, that you have at least one and maybe a few readings about what is community-based learning and what is the impact and stuff. Or what what does it mean? There's a great article in your packet by Tanya Mitchell, like critical service learning versus like charity-based community service learning. So. We recommend it be part of the actual curriculum of what students read and discuss. Okay, and that's just talk in the abstract. Okay. And just to make sure, like, so Canvas Commons, that was something new to me. It's it's a way that when you're adding in modules into your Canvas course, you can uh, add in a pre-built module that's been built by somebody else, and you can share it too. So it's if you know of other faculty who might be interested in community-based research uh, or community-based learning, and you want to send them the link, like a, a mini module, it could be the module on student achievement or leadership. So that would then send them information that their students could use on Eagle Endowment or the President's Volunteer Service Award or um, on other ways to get recognized for what they do versus something that's more on the resources side of like teaching a CB course. So we're, we will divvy it up in different ways through the Canvas Commons modules. And then you could almost like pick and choose which of these modules work on my uh, Canvas course, and that should be hopefully a way to keep it all in one space um, without getting a lot of emails and needing to to uh, sift through it. So, so you just link to that? Yeah, so it actually adds it into your Canvas course so under the module. The yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do you do crediting or ethics? So you're not plagiarizing in that type of a thing? It's in Canvas Commons, so, so okay. if you're putting in Canvas Commons, you're okay. You're okay. Yeah. yeah, it's like um, we're, we're building it with the intent to share. Yeah, yeah, here I can uh, admit you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. I don't know why this is really good shutting down. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's tired <okay>. too. <laughs>
All right. Stretch. Yeah. Actually, so I think we is. Have used that resource. So that's okay, so for instance, right now, if you're in Canvas, you go to Commons down here. Anything in Canvas Commons is from the university and you can add. So for instance, there's syllabus templates, uh, there's different courses. This is the lift page, for instance. So this is what we asked people to share this year. So it was clear, like, what are the requirements? Here's a link to start your application. Here are the links that you're probably going to need. Here's contact information. This way, you don't have to recreate. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, we hope. And then it is really as stupid easy as it looks. You click import, yeah. and then you go to Canvas, and you can just add it wherever. Well, it already you says you created this. Yep. Yeah. 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 So the idea with Canvas Commons is that's why they're using you the Commons. Yeah. Exactly. So our goal is to build out more of these. For this Genius. Time. Yeah. It really is. Um, thank you. <laughs> that makes a PowerPoint really yeah, we only we're we're almost what questions uh, or comments do people have because we are actually at the end. Yeah, we have just two two left on resources and on upcoming events. So I think the next one is the nonprofit directories, which are located in the back of this room as well as on our website. And then moving into the 23, or here are upcoming events and opportunities. So in early August, uh, we'll send out the CSLP language. You can include that on your syllabus. We'll send it out both in email and through Canvas Commons. Uh, also, please sign up for our CSLP class presentations. So I or somebody else will come into the class, present about different, um, not only just CSLP, but some of the other ways that students can get involved and get, uh, get closer to community-based learning through a few of those programs mentioned. Then either late August or early September, we're still like working out the dates on it. We'll have that uh, faculty community partner brunch as well as the fair. We might host those on the same day. That's what we did this last year. The deadline to apply for CSLP is September 11th, which is the ad drop date. And then so try and have your class presentations before then. Uh, that's like kind of the main thing there. And the orientation, kind of the first one is on the 6th. And then we might host a second one after the 11th, but at that point, students really hopefully have decided, okay, I want to do CSLP rather than I am not sure, so I'm going to this orientation to learn what it is. Then October is the deadline for spring. Sorry, that's my mistake. I should say 24 uh, to that to apply for, for the next year. Uh, we are still taking CV applications for now up and through the fall. Um, and graduate courses are now allowed to be CV courses. So that's a, a really nice um, uh, addition to our CV courses. If you know of any graduate professors or if you teach any courses that you think would be good CV fits, capstones are usually really good ones or anything working within an MPA program or with uh, nonprofits is, is usually a good fit. And then again, in January, we'll host our next fair. And it's just some content info. Yeah. Um, what lingering questions, <laughs> comments, concerns, et cetera, do people have? I, I have a quick question. Um, so I'm doing a, I'm listed as doing a, um, a course in the fall with a mini service learning component. And I was looking through the nonprofit um, lists and I've come up with some that I think are good fits. So what's the next step? Do I start to contact them or do I work with within your organization to do that? Yeah, great. Of course. You know, I would just say it couldn't hurt to let Sagar and I know which rooms you're thinking of, because if we have a great contact there, we can sort of do the introductions. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It yeah. Might your coordinator, but it might be, oh, I know the director. Let me connect you with the director. If we don't know anybody, then I would get yeah, introduce, write an email to the, someone and say, this is what I'd like to do. Can we talk, you know, on the phone or in person to talk about what it could look like and give them a little background on your course and maybe what you're hoping for. Uh, that's, help, that's helpful because I know how delicate these relationships are. And I, I want to work within a system that already exists. Yeah, so feel free to, to send me the list of ones you're interested in, and I'll take the next step there to make sure that we're on the same page. 
uh, one of the comments actually, and this I thought was a great idea by Kiana during the panel, was uh, formalizing something like a project description. So that's something that I'm now going to be looking for to see if others have like a, a template so that if there is a class, they have a project in mind, or maybe we can help outline what a project would look like. Then we could send that over to, in theory, multiple community partners at once and see who would be the most responsive or who's most interested in that. So I'll, I'll try and start working on some sort of template for a project description. And then um, if anyone has any ideas or I can run that through my And also it's worthwhile to go to the organization's website and see if they have a, a, a volunteer section, both because it'll tell you what they say, at least say they need, even though it might be broader, or who the contact person is. But I feel like you know these directories are huge, but it's also possible that we can say, hey, on the affordable housing list, these are three great groups that we highly recommend. You know, if, if that's helpful for you, it depends on you know what your areas are. But one of the other resources for finding community partners is the catalog of, for philanthropy. Uh, they are, of course, more philanthropy focused, but what's really cool about their website is that you can um, uh, sort by, actually, I don't know if you're able to pull it up, Amanda. Um, you can sort by like issue area, you could sort by location within DC. So depending on what some of the, um, what you're kind of looking for, that catalog site is nice and interactive. The directories, of course, are already pre-sorted. And this is a way that if you see that filter your search on the left-hand side, if you click like human services, for example, uh, that drop down there, uh, sorry, um, human services, yeah. yeah. So if you click there and you're looking for, okay, I wanna work with immigrant, I'm a SIS professor, and so immigrant and refugee services or like girls and women, and then, it will give you all of the list. You can click on learn more and find, that's actually how we ended up getting in touch with my sister's place too, was through their development arm because we met them through this catalog for philanthropy. So mm -hmm. there, um, this is a, another, like, and quite honestly, this is very unique to DC. I've tried to find something similar in New York and other spots and uh, this greater area of DC has a, has a really good list. How much do you do like technologists with our Maryland and Virginia. Do you just focus on DC and nothing there? Or we have a few mm -hmm. sites that are very strong, like a wider circle or um there in Silver Spring. Yeah. But the trouble is the transportation. Like if students don't have a car, you certainly don't want to encourage them to have to pay more for transportation or spend endless amounts of time. There's absolutely it's absolutely some places are closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we've worked, worked with like Ethiopian uh, development organization in Arlington, but sometimes you're right, getting to Arlington can be just as quick as getting to whatever Anapaska. So we're not opposed to it, it's more access for students and how much time it takes. But I mean, we have used the lift funds to get to sites in Maryland and Virginia this year. Uh -huh. um, it's one of the reasons we're asking for more lift money because again, we would like to serve with the organizations. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we'd also like to at some point have a second van for community-based learning <laughs> and transportation, but that's a slightly bigger ask. It's ambitious. We do. My office does have a van, seven passenger van, but it's mostly used for our DC Reads program. So we can occasionally offer it, and it's just has to do a background check to drive its other students around, you know. But I, I'm not I'm not sure how regularly we can provide it. It's not out of the question though if you have a group. We don't want to send one person to van. Okay. The university place? used to have a zip car yeah. membership and partnership with students or for students. That yeah. is no longer the case. Yeah. But they do have a partnership with Lyft. I mean, that's a formal partnership. Yeah, no, I'm saying, yeah. I think it's probably a zip and it was, you know, yeah. And it used to be, there used to be one. No, no. Athletics department had a lot of vans and we were also able to use those and then they, they sold them. So that's gone to, yeah. Any other final questions? I know it's been a long day. <laughs> and Anything we are else? happy to answer questions via email. Yeah, whatever would help with this. Everybody good? This is great. Thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have some chips and uh, thanks, Jonathan. Have a rest of the week. Thank you. Bye.